Okay, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Hope everybody can see us and hear us. Um, my name is Charu Kaushik, and uh, I am the scientific director of the Institute of Infection and Immunity at the Canadian Institutes of Health Research and a co-chair of the GLOPEDAR. Uh, and I welcome my co-chair, uh, Yazdin Yazdin Spana, who is the chair of the GLOPEDAR, as well as the director of INSERM Reacting Consortium and the INSERM Institute of Infectious Disease, Microbiology and Immunology. Uh, on behalf of GLOPEDAR, I welcome you all to the uh, COVID-19 Research Synergies meeting. Uh, and today we are starting off the series of meetings with the vaccine session. So Yazdin, uh, I'll ask you to say a few words about Glopidar. Thank you, Charu. So uh, uh, good afternoon, good morning, good night to everyone because we have people from all around the world. So I'm just going to say very few words on the Global Glopidar, which is uh, an international network of research funding organization that was launched in 2013 to facilitate, accelerate, and deepen collaboration between research funders during emerging diseases uh, uh, with the idea of investing uh, in strengthening global research preparedness between crises and in mobilizing resources to respond rapidly and effectively. Uh, to these infectious diseases. Although now we can see that there is uh, no between crisis, basically. We have all the time in crisis. Uh, so the G20 recognized GLOPIDR, the G said welcomed its action, and the EC uh, financed the GLOPIDR secretariat through uh, the uh, Foundation uh, Merriot and University of Oxford. Next slide. So uh, today we have more than 29 members and two observers from around the world. As you can see, all the countries that are involved uh, 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 in, as funders uh, 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 in Global R. Next slide. Um, so regarding the response to COVID-19, uh, 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 we have members, observers, and stakeholders that were mobilized in the response. I'm not going to detail everything, but uh, we first collected information on mem members and existing research activities. We had close collaboration since the beginning with the WHO and particularly WHO uh, blueprint and in particular in the organization of the roadmap that uh, uh, was organized in uh, Geneva in February 2020 in launching emergency calls. And what we really tried to do was to coordinate funders as much as we can to try to optimize resources to avoid duplication and to cover priorities listed in the research and uh, uh, development roadmap of the uh, 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 WHO. Next slide. And to finish, uh, because I'm uh, two minutes, I just, at that time, we also decided that it would go, be good to have all the researchers together after a few months to talk about what they have been done. Thanks a lot. Back to you, Charu, and I wanted to particularly thank Charu and everyone for all the great work for organizing these sessions. Thank you very much, Yazdin. So uh, with that, I'll uh, do a few housekeeping notes and then welcome the co-chairs uh, for this session. Uh, so just to let uh, all the participants know that uh, we will be taking audience questions during the uh, panel discussions. Uh, and to particularly point out to you that if you want uh, the questions and answers or questions to be considered, please use the Q&A box that is there at the bottom right next to the chat box. Uh, the chat box might have a lot more uh, uh, chatting and other discussions going on. So we are going to focus only on the Q&A session rather than chat box. So feel free to use the chat box for other discussion points. Uh, I also want to let everybody know that this meeting is being recorded and live streamed on YouTube. Uh, and then with that, I would like to welcome the co-chairs of this session, Dr. Anita Zaidi. Uh, and uh, substituting for Dr. Melanie Saville today is Dr. Yebra, Deborah Yaski. 
Uh, I would like to uh, express regret on Melanie's behalf. Uh, part of the issue of having uh, amazingly high profile co-chairs is that they are actually very much involved in the response to COVID. So Melanie, unfortunately, yesterday uh, had to uh, tell us that she was pulled out for an emergency meeting this morning. Uh, she will be joining us on the final session on the 23rd. And I'd like to thank Deborah for stepping in at the last minute and uh, uh, able to uh, substitute for Melanie. Uh, so um, uh, Deborah Yeski is, is the Head of Regulatory Affairs North America of CEPI. Uh, before this, she was uh, serving in similar positions, Head of uh, Director of Regulatory and Quality Affairs Division uh, in BARDA and in the U.S. Uh, Department of uh, Health and Human Services. Uh, so welcome, Deborah, and thank you so much for uh, doing this at the last minute. Uh, and Dr. Anita Zaidi, uh, who is a physician and the director of uh, Vaccine Development, Surveillance, and Entric and Diarrheal Disease Program at BMGF. Uh, and uh, uh, Anita has uh, worked extensively on vaccine development in LMIC, surveillance, uh, and has done a significant amount of work in this area. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Anita and Melanie who have worked tirelessly with the team to put together an amazing program today. Uh, and finally, I'd like to acknowledge the team who's been working behind the scenes. Uh, my colleagues from CIHR, Genevieve Boily larouche uh, Deborah Cursiguera, uh, and Danielle Vitali who are handling everything from behind the scenes. So thank you very much. And with that, I'll hand it over to you, Anita. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Charu, uh, and uh, greetings and welcome everyone to this session one uh, of the Globedar meeting, which appropriately is on vaccines. Um, and I hope uh, uh, that we will have a fantastic discussion uh, and presentations today. Um, vaccines are our best hope for ending this pandemic. Uh, I want to thank uh, uh, Charu you and your team at Globadar for putting together the program um, and uh, I look forward to uh, discussions uh, uh, as we uh, go through the program. Um, to set the scene, uh, we will start the program by an overview of where we are today in SARS-CoV-2 vaccine development. Um, and as a, a scientific community, this is uh, unprecedented progress that has been made in six months uh, in tackling this pandemic. What normally uh, you would see happening in five to seven years, we've seen happen in, in five to six months. Um, there is huge scientific engagement across the world, many people, many institutions involved, but it is uh, appropriate to start uh, the program today with a representative of CEPI, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness and, um, and uh, Innovation. Uh, doc, Dr. Deborah Yeski uh, to give the opening talk. Um, and for those of you who don't know, um, CEPI is a young organization. It was founded only in 2017 in the aftermath of the horrible West African Ebola uh, crisis. Um, Co-founders included Norway, UK, EC, Germany, uh, the Wellcome Trust and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And who knew that uh, CEPI would be challenged in this way so short, so soon after its founding. Um, so um, uh, let me hand over uh, to uh, Dr. Deborah Yaski, uh, who is, uh, as you heard uh, Dr. Koshik say, substituting for uh, Dr. Melanie Savell at the last minute, uh, in fact, only yesterday. Uh, because of this really important meeting that's happening uh, today, which I can, I'll mention later on in, in the program, which will influence a lot of what we see happening over the next six to 12 months. Thank you. Uh, over to you, Deborah. Thanks, Anita. Um, and, and thank you to um, uh, Charu and all of the, the folks that have put this, uh, and, and Melanie, to put this uh, 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 great agenda together for today. So I'm just going to take a couple minutes to talk about um, the scene setting for uh, vaccine development for COVID-19. Next slide. This is just to give um, this graphic uh, just kind of 
uh, uh, saw it yesterday for the first time, um, uh, just jumping in. It, it's just amazing to um, see that there are over 200 uh, um, vaccine candidates, um, you know, um, starting for COVID-19. And as we can see from here is that, you know, the, the top um, developers by region, geographical location, we see North America, uh, Europe, China and, and Asia um, are, are leading the pack here as far as uh, vaccine development. Um, next slide. This um, is uh, uh, just a snapshot again of the pipeline that uh, uh, of the vaccines that are in the clinic. Um, and it was, uh, even though it says the date of today, um, I got this yesterday. So it, it might be out of date even as of today, but it just gives you, um, and, and I know it's hard to see, but it just gives you a, a snapshot of, of those vaccines that are in the clinic. Um, <clears throat> and then just to, to note, and we'll get in, I'll get into it a little bit later, that the pink shaded ones um, are right now in what we call co the COVAX portfolio. Um, and, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> Again, just scene setting and just to, to, you know, for us to get our arms around, um, you know, the vaccine development landscape. This graphic just shows that, um, you know, the, the previous slide were the, the vaccines that are in clinic now. These are the vaccines which are, are more than 60 slated to be in the clinic um, by quarter. And we're, if, if you look at um, Q3, we're talking about um, close to 27 uh, vaccines will uh, enter the clinic in uh, third quarter, which is, you know, right around the corner. Uh, next slide. So, as we all know, um, in this in this uh, in this audience, the traditional vaccine uh, landscape and and how uh, vaccines get uh, uh, licensed by regulatory authorities, uh, and it's uh, largely sequential. Um, however, for you know response to COVID nineteen, we've had to um, compress timelines and do things in parallel and at risk. Um, and that means, um, you know, we will talk a little bit about our mantra, speed, scale, and access. This, um, you know, means that, you know, we are manufacturing at risk, which then puts, you know, there's a financial risk to that as well. Uh, next slide. Um, you know, just to, to, highlight the, the different vaccine platforms uh, for COVID-19. Uh, and, and, and we know these, and they all have different attributes. No one vaccine is, is perfect and has all the attributes that you would want in one single vaccine platform. For instance, the RNA uh, vaccines um, are, are very fast and, and usually the first to get into the clinic. However, when you look at the scale, they're usually low to medium scale. Um, and as con uh, conversely, the recombinant uh, protein vaccines are a little bit slower to get in the clinic, but uh, the, um, the scale is higher and it makes it more attractive uh, for making um, millions to billions of doses. Next slide. This is just to um, uh, highlight uh, the CEPI COVID portfolio. We have nine candidates in, uh, in our portfolio and um, nearly all of them are in the clinic. Um, and again, uh, we are, uh, are, are, you know, progressing with speed, scale, and access. And it's very um, important for, you know, response to this pandemic uh, to, as I said, as I mentioned before, to do things, um, uh, you know, in parallel so that we can scale up and we're doing things at risk and to make sure, um, and this was uh, in CEPI's mission statement is, um, it's very uh, important to us for equitable access. And then for this in particular um, access, once we have those vaccine doses and they're approved um, or licensed to get them to those that need it quickly. Next slide. 
So just a little bit about um, the uh, access to COVID-19 tools accelerator, the ACT accelerator. It has um, uh, uh, three pillars. And so the, 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 you know, I'm going to try not to use the word unprecedented because I think that we 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 all use it, but it it really is unprecedented times, and that you know this global pandemic requires uh, an all hands on deck, and and this act accelerator uh, is uh, a result of that, and uh, we're bringing together through the ACT Accelerator, um, you know, global stakeholders to respond to and protect, to protect the global public health. There are three pillars here, the diagnostics, therapeutics, and uh, vaccines. The vaccine pillar is also um, uh, uh, termed as COVAX, uh, which is co-led by CEPI, Gavi, and WHO. CEPI in particular um, is the, the work stream lead for the development, um, research development and manufacturing of vaccines. Uh, and then Gavi for the procurement and delivery and uh, WHO for the policy and allocation. Um, so within the, the CEPI work stream uh, for the uh, research, development, and manufacturing. We're working hand in glove with all of our stakeholders, in, including our developers, um, for uh, the, a, an end-to-end -end process. Next slide. So our goal for uh, the COVAX is um, what's on the slide there. Uh, and it's a, it's a lofty goal, um, but I, you know, I, I think in no other time is the world so focused on on one goal? And so, um, while it's it's daunting and and lofty, I think uh, you know we are all striving uh, to to meet this goal. Next slide. Again, just to to reiterate the Covax, um, we have um, a number of bodies within the Covax uh, work stream to. Um, leverage uh, a, a unified voice, again, looking at the end-to-end -end tools to help our developers meet the goal of getting uh, safe and effective vaccines in a very timely manner to get those out to, um, uh, to the citizens of, of the globe. Um, we're working with transparency with our, um, our partners. Um, we're looking for innovations and we're utilizing all of our partners' capacities and capabilities. Next slide. And I, th I think that was my last slide, but just to... So it looks like we're having some technical glitches. Uh, Anita, did you want to take over? Are you, can, are you sure? I, th I think uh, Deborah was uh, uh, just ending, so um, that I think this, the timing was uh, not that bad. Uh, so um, the uh, um, uh, as you uh, heard from Deborah's slide, we have uh, over twenty candidate products uh, now in the clinic already. Uh, against SARS-CoV-2 uh, and several uh, starting phase three in the next couple of months. Um, there is a very ambitious goal of having 100 million doses for people uh, around the world in by 2020, so within the next six months, and 2 billion doses uh, by 2021. Now, <laughs> that's easier said than done. Um, and uh, there are many, many issues that will need to be tackled uh, before we can get there. 
um, and some of them we are going to be uh, trying to cover uh, today in the presentations. Um, we have an hour for the first uh, section, which is on uh, correlates of protection and safety. Um, two really important areas uh, in vaccine development. Uh, we have four speakers. Um, all of the speakers are requested to keep to the 10 minutes uh, that they are allotted. Uh, and we will take questions and answers together uh, uh, at the end. And uh, if you would put the questions and answers in the Q&A uh, uh, section, not the chat section, that would be very helpful. Uh, so with that, let me um, introduce the first uh, um, speaker, Dr. Um, uh, Volker um, Getz. Good uh, from um, the University of uh, Saskatchewan. Uh, Dr. Goetz is the director and CEO of the Vaccine and Infectious Disease Organization, International Vaccine Center, WIDO Intervac for short, which is uh, located at the University of Saskatchewan in Saskatoon, Canada. So uh, Dr. Goetz, all yours. Good morning, thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. All right, well, thank you for the invitation. Uh, so just a brief introduction to Vito Intervac for those that are not familiar with it. We are one of uh, Canada's largest uh, research organization focused on infectious diseases and vaccines for both animals and humans, have uh, commercialized a number of vaccines, as you can see here, spun off companies and hold uh, the university's largest patent portfolio. Next slide, please. But most importantly for COVID-19, uh, we, we led Canada's response. Um, we were the first in Canada to isolate the virus. This was in partnership with Sunnybrook at, in, in Ontario and uh, the National Microbiology Lab. We were the first in the country to have an animal model established and that was the ferret model, but now we also have the hamster model established and ourselves are working on a vaccine that I will talk a little bit later. Um, as you can see, we're of course a member of um, these expert groups, as many of us are. But then the last one is really the most important on this slide here. Um, we operate one of the largest um, high containment labs in North America, and I'll show that on the next slide. And we have now received well over 100 requests from all um, kind of industries, small, large, international, national, academic collaborators, and so on, to help them in their work. And, and we're using our animal models for the preclinical work for these candidates. Next slide, please. So this is the Intervac facility. As I mentioned, it's one of the largest in the world. Um, the point here of this is that we can house thousands of hamsters and, and uh, ferrets in this facility. So we can do many, many trials in parallel. And then this is what I was mentioning before. We're happy to assist others in their preclinical work um, using our animal models. And we're also establishing up here in this um, part of the building a pilot scale manufacturing facility, which will come on stream next year and will hopefully help with some production of the vaccine. Next slide, please. Uh, just to acknowledge, uh, there's lots of people involved in the work and it's um, mainly led by Daryl Falzerano, one of our scientists here. So I thought it was important that um, we acknowledge him and, and the work he's doing. Next slide, please. So in terms of the ferret and hamster model, um, we established that in March already. So as many other um, around the world are seeing, uh, ferrets overall show a very mild clinical disease. However, they're a good model to assess viral um, replication in the respiratory tract, in particular the upper respiratory tract. Uh, the hamster is a little bit more clinically, a little bit more severe. Um, and again, allows us to assess replication in the upper respiratory tract as a readout um, for vaccine efficacy. Next slide, please. So this is just showing here, if you um, click on it again, maybe that picture on the left side didn't come through, that's fine. Um, so this is just an overview of the initial uh, experiment. We've done now several experiments in ferrets and the results are fairly consistent. So going in intranasally with a challenge uh, next slide, please. And you can see that we can isolate um, the virus back from the nasal wash to some extent also from the oral wash. There is very little in other mucosal sites. And then on the bottom left here, you can clearly see that um, there is large quantities of virus that can be found in the nasal turbinate, so the upper respiratory tract. And um, typically 
uh, within the first uh, four to five days is when we see the peak of, of those. Next slide, please. When we look at the pathology, it's um, um, consistent with what you would see within pneumonia. We, we're currently doing some work characterizing this in more detail, but obviously there is pathology in these animals and uh, gross lesions that you microscopically can assess and so on. So indicative of an, an pneumonia happening in these animals. Next slide, please. For the hamster, it's a little bit more severe in that um, some of these hamsters, depending on the dose, are getting very, very, um, very sick. Um, their weight loss is, uh, can be um, dramatic in these animals. We also find an age difference, as you can see on the top left there. Um, older animals seem to be more susceptible um, than younger animals. And then as you can see in the bottom right, there's large amounts of virus that can be re-isolated again in the upper respiratory tract from these animals, so by doing nasal washes. Next slide, please. So now in terms of our own vaccine development, if you can click again, please. Uh, we're working uh, like many others, and as we heard in the introduction on a subunit vaccine candidate, um, we have various constructs and testing right now. Our main focus is on, on an optimized as one at the moment, but we're also working on the RVD and so on. And so what, what is key for us is, of course, like many others are doing, looking at the, um, the conformational um, structure of the, the antigen, especially the trimer formation. But then where we are putting a lot of effort in is identifying the proper adjuvant for our vaccine. I will show you the data later on, but this seems to be critical in determining uh, vaccine efficacy. Um, if you don't have a good TH1 end user, we believe that the vaccines will not be effective. It. And so we're using a proprietary adjuvant that was developed as part of a, a larger um, grand challenges in global health program funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, we've tested this now with a number of our glycoproteins and in here for COVID-19, it uh, seems to be highly effective. And I'll show you the data. Uh, we're expressing the protein in two mammalian cells, HAC-293s, as well as CHOs. And the reason for that is that the, the protein has uh, a number of glycosylation sites. There's 13 of them that are critical. And so we think it's important to assess this by, by using different mammalian cells that allow different glycosylation patterns to see if any of that relates to differences in immunogenicity. Um, next slide, please. And so here's where we are at the moment. We're currently making GMP material, both of our adjuvant as well as our constructs. Engineering batches are already available and being used for safety testing. So you can see we're right now here in the safety studies and, and then have uh, scheduled our first human clinical trials in October of next uh, this year. Next slide, please. So this is just showing you now here two vaccine candidates using two different adjuvants. Um, so there is the adjuvant that I mentioned, our proprietary adjuvant, which is a good TH1 end user. And then for comparison, we're using a commercial adjuvant that is being now used by many of the vaccine development developers as provided by a large manufacturer as, as part of their pandemic adjuvant. And so what we can see here is that overall, we're getting good immune responses. These are neutralizing antibodies, so very high titers, looks all great. So after one immunization is day 28, Day 56, we clearly see that the vaccine, both vaccine candidates are inducing high levels of neutralizing antibody titers. And then after challenge, there's hardly an increase, but then the control group is coming up indicating that the animals have seen the virus. Next slide, please. But most importantly, when we now look at the viral infection in the upper respiratory tract and here broken down now by the two uh, vaccines and the control groups, you can see that only the vaccine that has the TH1 inducing adjuvant is really a balanced TH1, TH2 response. The adjuvant here um, makes a difference and you can see six out of the eight animals are essentially uh, free in their upper respiratory tract, whereas um, only two animals have um, some viral shedding in, in their upper respiratory tract. Comparing this to the commercial adjuvant that is currently being used by many and groups around the world, you can clearly see that the adjuvant here does not make a difference in, in this trial um, compared to the control group. There is statistically, no, like except for this day here, there's no difference between these groups, whereas um, all of this here is statistically significant. So you can really see that the adjuvant makes a difference. And of course, we all know that for subunit vaccines that the adjuvant is critical. 
In particular, though, for COVID-19, we think this is absolutely key in, in going forward um, in considering um, and, and this. There's a question here. These are ferrets now. This is in the ferret model. Next slide, please. And so here's our timelines. As I mentioned, we're in the middle of our safety and talk studies right now. We're gonna do an NHP study here in October, October to end of December, and then in parallel we're going into phase one um, starting in October, and this will be done in Canada. Next slide, please. And that's my last slide, so thank you very much and happy to answer any questions later on. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kurtz. Uh, can I, may I ask Dr. Uh, John Lewis uh, to start his presentation on vaccine-mediated enhanced disease? Uh, Dr. Lewis is the CEO of uh, Entos Pharmaceuticals, a biotechnology company developing genetic medicines using the Phosphogenics drug delivery system. Entos is developing Phosphogenics DNA-based uh, vaccines for COVID-19. Uh, Dr. Lewis. Thank you so much, Anita, and thank you so much for the uh, invitation to speak today. So I'm going to speak today quickly about uh, 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 an issue that, that's uh, you know, present in the minds of everybody developing vaccines, and this is the idea that we can enhance disease by, by trying to protect ourselves against it. So I just want to split it into the two topics, uh, really, that are, are separate in their mechanism, vaccine-enhanced disease and antibody-dependent enhancement. Next slide. Uh, so so vaccine-enhanced disease, uh, is more of an antigen presentation issue uh, and, and really exemplified by uh, issues with the uh, formal and inactivated uh, respiratory syncytial uh, virus vaccine developed in the 1960, 1960s. Um, so uh, inactivated RSV uh, uh, was administered to children, which, which made it particularly uh, troubling. Um, it was uh, the inactivation protocol was uh, performed with formalin uh, which unfortunately uh, blocked its proper processing uh, in, in the cytosol to produce a, a proper antigen presentation. And, uh, and, and what this uh, unfortunately did was uh, skew the response to a CD4-based uh, response, a, a, a TH2 skewed immune response, which then led to severely enhanced disease, uh, hospitalization in many cases, and, and in some cases, in fact, mortality in these vaccinated uh, infants. So at the time, the pulmonary histopathology was reported in the literature as a peribronchular monocytic infiltration with some excesses in the cinephils. We know a little bit more about that now. Um, and these, these observations were further supported by reports of increased numbers of the eosinophils uh, and CD4, but not uh, CD8 T cells in mice and, and high levels of uh, type 2 cytokines in, in mouse models. Um, so so really, this is an inappropriate uh, 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 T cell response uh, in response to this inappropriate uh, uh, processing of the antigens. Uh, and, and as Volker mentioned, this can, you know, has been addressed largely these days by the, the development of more advanced uh, adjuvants and, uh, and the, the, you know, the development of genetic vaccines that, that uh, produce the antigens in the cytosol. Next slide. So, so something that's, uh, that's present in the minds of many vaccine developers is the, this other issue, antibody-dependent enhancement, which is really uh, important because it's, it's directly tied to the mechanism of action of, of neutralization and clearance of, uh, of, of the virus. And so typically this will, you know, when, when you get vaccinated uh, against a, a, a pathogen, you produce a variety of antibodies. Some of these are neutralizing, preventing uh, uptake uh, an infection. Some of these are non-neutralizing. Some of these may be actually enhancement, so or, or enhancing in that they will uh, bind the virus, but then uh, mediated through their FC receptors, uh, be taken up in, in certain cells that express FC receptors, like macrophages, and and, and up certain other cells are expressed as well, facilitating viral entry. And and this can se uh, severely enhance infection and and therefore disease. Uh, and and this can also be mediated by a complement mediated pathway. Next slide. And so uh, I'm making a bold statement here, but certainly in our experience so far uh, and in our discussions with many, it seems like the in vitro assays don't do a great job of predicting vaccine enhancement. Uh, uh, so the antibody dependent uh, or otherwise. Uh, that said though, I think uh, we're in sort of this rapid development and, and, and knowledge gaining about SARS-CoV-2 specifically. And I think as, as specific mechanisms are identified uh, for potential enhancement, uh, 
uh, we may be able to develop assays to address those. Next slide. And so we have some, uh, some pretty good uh, and growing preclinical evidence so far. Uh, I'm gonna just present some non-human primate data that suggests we have some optimism on this front. So in, in a couple of re-challenge studies, if you look at uh, rhesus macaques that were re-challenged 28 days after their initial infection, uh, and, and in particular focusing on the animals that had very low neutralizing titers and that had viral shedding, uh, so, so no uh, evidence of advanced or enhanced disease was seen, uh, seen in this experiment. Again, uh, uh, another cohort of nine macaques uh, uh, that had uh, neutralizing antibodies, uh, antibody needed effector functions and CD4 and CD8 T cells, uh, all of these were associated with uh, protection upon rechallenge at 35 days uh, without any evidence of, of ADE. Uh, on the vaccination side, these are just a couple of examples of many that have been published now. Uh, first on the inactivated uh, vaccine front, so macaques immunized with uh, inactivated SARS-CoV-2 in alum uh, had uh, protection against a high inoculate of uh, SARS-CoV-2, and, uh, and in that study, no uh, histopathological analysis had no evidence of ADE, and, and subsequently uh, a larger study uh, using uh, uh, raw plasma DNA in 35 rhesus macaques uh, with a variety of, of different constructs, including full-length spike and, and receptor binding domain, showed a really good correlation protection uh, with neutralizing antibodies. And even though this is FCC uh, receptor dependent effector functions, we didn't see any adverse outcomes with challenge. So this is, this is the reason for optimism. Next slide. So a little bit about our platform. So, so it's a good segue. We're, we, so we think the a DNA based uh, approach, uh, I think is, is, is compelling from the standpoint because we get proper uh, good antigen presentation. Of course, with DNA, we have a lot more flexibility in the incorporation of, uh, of, of uh, antigens and antigen combinations, and uh, it has a lot of compelling features for scale up and, and distribution. Uh, obviously, DNA is very stable. Um, if you look at what's out there, and I showed you an example of a, a sort of a, a raw plasma DNA injection, uh, but typically uh, DNA is introduced either through electroporation uh, or, or by using another virus like an adenovirus, uh, as many, many of the, uh, the clinical vaccines uh, are using. Um, our platform is, is a sort of a hybrid between the two. So we use a lipid nanoparticle platform uh, that's easily manufactured and scaled, but it, for the viral enter, or sorry, for the uh, DNA entry, instead of using uh, an ionic or cationic lipid for entry, we utilize a small virus-derived uh, fusion protein dubbed the fusion-associated small transmembrane proteins. And these were discovered uh, by a key team member, Roy Duncan at Dalhousie, a, a Canadian virologist. And basically, so we can formulate these lipid nanoparticles containing plasma DNA, incorporating these fusion-associated small transmembrane proteins in the, in the lipid shell. And these facilitate direct fusion of the DNA vaccine into the, uh, uh, into the cytoplasm. Next slide. So, um, so starting in January this year, we, we, under, uh, we started a, what we call the rapid prototyping process, you know, thinking about generating both neutralizing antibody response, but also a potent and durable T cell response. So we looked at combinations of spike protein, N protein, and optimized uh, epitopes. Next slide. And, uh, and, and of course, we, we, we looked at in, uh, in vitro assays, in this case, pseudotype virus assays, for looking at both uh, antibody dependent uh, enhancement or neutralization. And, uh, and as Volker mentioned, we're working with Vito Intervac to look at parent challenge models, uh, hamster challenge, uh, and also we're looking at immunogenicity in, in non human primates. Next slide. So just quickly some data. So we've uh, encapsulated now uh, a variety of different plasmid constructs in, uh, in what we're dubbing a covigenics vaccine using this uh, fusion associated small transmembrane platform. Uh, we're able to elicit with very, so this is a two dose regimen given on day one and 14, 25 microgram dose where we think the MTD is about two milligrams. We're getting a, a very strong T cell based response. Next slide. And with the Zest vaccine, uh, uh, and I'm sure we'll talk about assays later, we've, uh, we, we got potent neutralizing antibody response. And we looked at a, a panel of convalescent patients, uh, about 20 patients we got in it with the full length S spike uh, vaccine, we got equivalent uh, neutralizing antibody at this low dose to convalescent patients. Next slide. One thing we're really interested in as well is the development of a, a pan-coronavirus T-cell vaccine. Uh, and these are based on, uh, in this particular case, a, a full-length N construct. 
Uh, it's early days with this, but at the same low dose of 25 micrograms, we're getting a potent uh, you know, CD8 uh, response. You can see in lymph nodes and spleen. Next slide. Uh, so, so I'll finish off there. I, I think you know we have a, a long way to go as far as developing in vitro assays, and it may, it may not happen. Um, I think it's been it's critical to establish correlates of protection. Uh, we've seen in our studies as well that that overall antibody anti spike response, for instance, is well correlated with neutralizing response. I think this uh, you know as we move on, we're going to be able to do mechanistic studies of of uh, either correlates of response or or enhancement uh, in animal models. And, uh, and I think uh, uh, we have a note, note of optimism that the preclinical evidence to date suggests that our modern vaccine approaches with modern adjuvants and genetic approaches have minimized the likelihood of enhanced disease. We'll hope that holds true because uh, we're heading into the clinic uh, to phase three studies. Thank you very much. And oh, last slide, sorry. Uh, yeah, so, so I represent uh, you know, a fantastic team of, of Canadians and throughout North America. Uh, and we're looking forward to starting our phase one, uh, phase two studies in Canada. Uh, with the Canadian Centre for Vaccinology in, in August or September this year. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Lewis. Uh, next, we have Dr. Sarah Gilbert from Oxford's Jenner Institute. And Dr. Sarah Gilbert is the project lead for the JADOX-1 uh, adenovirus uh, vector vaccine that I'm sure many of you have heard about. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gilbert, all yours now. Thank you. Um, so today I'm going to talk about imaginicity, how to measure imaginicity uh, in the vaccine trials that we're all running. Um, just a little bit of background on the technology that we're using. It's uh, the simian adenovirus vector vaccine, CHADOX-1, replication deficient. So, um, and expresses full length spike protein. It doesn't replicate after vaccination because the E1 gene has been removed. That needs to be supplied in trans during manufacturing in the cell line that's used for manufacturing. The E3 gene has been removed as well, which gives more space for adding in a trans gene. So um, we're using a simian adenovirus because this avoids issues with pre-existing immunity to human adenoviruses and the pre-existing immunity to this viral vector is very low in Europeans um, and we will be studying that more across the world as we roll out the, the programs that we're currently running. The vaccine antigen is in the DNA of the adenovirus. It's not a structural part of the virion, so this is a true platform technology. And the um, vaccine antigen, the full-length spike protein in this case, is not expressed until after the vaccine has been administered and entered a cell, uh, and then the spike protein will be expressed inside that cell to be processed in the same way it would be if the cell was infected by live coronavirus. That results in an immune response which induces strong B and T cell responses after single vaccination, and that's what we then want to measure in our immunogenicity experiments. So we have considerable experience of using this platform technology before using it um, in SARS-CoV-2 vaccine development. Prior to April of this year, we had conducted 12 phase one studies with 330 subjects vaccinated um, with different antigens in these vaccines. But simian adenoviruses in general, uh, as, a, as opposed to just CHALX-1, had been used in clinical trials of over 6,000 subjects of all ages, from infants in malaria vaccine trials to older adults in flu vaccine trials. And we've seen a very consistent safety profile and strong immunogenicity after one dose in these trials. More relevant to SARS-CoV-2 vaccine development, we'd also been working on a vaccine against another coronavirus, the MERS coronavirus, and as is now published, and you can see the references on the bottom of the slide, um, single dose of telex one mers was protective in non-human primates, and it um, has completed a phase one study in the UK, which has been published, and uh, there's an ongoing phase one study in Saudi Arabia. Next slide, please. So to illustrate um, the assays that we're using to measure imaginicity, I'm going to present you with some figures that have already been published in a preprint. Uh, again, the link to this is below. This should shortly be accepted as a full paper. Uh, and in this study, we looked at uh, the administration of one or two doses of CHADOX-1 and COV-19 in pigs. This is purely an imaginicity study. There was no attempt to, to challenge the pigs to test vaccine efficacy or look for enhanced disease. We're just looking at imaginicity here. But a wide range of assays were used, and that's why I've chosen this to illustrate um, the ways we can measure imaginicity in vaccine trials. So starting from uh, the assay on the left, uh, ELISA workhorse assay in many labs, uh, where we're measuring antibodies that bind to the full-length spike protein. And what we have here is we can do this um, 
uh, on multiple days on the day of vaccination and then multiple days post vaccination. And we can follow um, the development of the antibody response in animals that receive one, which are the open circles, or two, which are the closed circles, doses of the vaccine. And we can see a, a nice induction of immune responses after the first vaccination. And in the animals who receive a second, we can see boosting of that response. So um, there are no units given on the y-axis here. Um, and that's deliberate. Uh, that's because uh, depending on the way you set up the ELISA in your own lab, you will get very different results. You may get um, a certain amount of variability between uh, assays run on different days. And although this type of assay is, is fine uh, without use of standards and calibrators in a preclinical study, when we move, move into clinical development, if we're measuring binding antibodies to the spike protein, we need to be um, much more careful about uh, validating and standardizing the assay. So all of the parameters that are in use in the experiment need to be tested and the upper and lower bounds for various parameters need to be determined. So that means determining the right amount of protein to coat the plate with. If we're doing a, a direct ELISA as this is, uh, what will the secondary antibody be? What will the incubation times be? All the steps of the assays uh, and testing those and testing how much you can vary from those parameters and still achieve the same results. And in order to standardize, we need to include the, the same amount of the same um, control serum sample or possibly a monoclonal antibody, but it's better if it's a serum sample of a polyclonal serum to be included in the assay uh, every time. And then all the results are normalized based on the re readout from the standard. And that enables us to get results which are comparable across days um, in the same lab, across operators in the same lab, and then eventually between labs, which may be in different countries. We should also be looking to include calibrators. So having standardized or normalized on the standard, we would then want to see that the calibrators, which are usually low, medium and high um, responding serum samples, will give us um, a very small range of variation between different assays after the standardization has been applied. So in this experiment, um, it's a first look-see to see how the antibody response is developing and does it change with a second vaccination. But to apply this for clinical trials, we need to do a lot more work on the assay to get to um, a standardized and validated assay. But we're also very interested in neutralizing antibodies when we're thinking about SARS coronavirus, because this is everybody's best guess at a correlative protection that hasn't actually been determined formally as a correlative protection, but that's what it, this is the type of immune response that everybody believes will be most likely to correlate with protective efficacy. Uh, and there are many different ways of doing neutralizing antibodies. One of the ones that is done is to look for complete absence of cytopathic effect in wells of vero cells, which have been um, incubated with a mixture of diluted serum and virus. Uh, and so that's looking for 100% ab ab absence of cytopathic effect. It's a very stringent assay. Uh, and so the serum titer or the serum dilution that will achieve that tends to be much lower than what's represented here, which is an ND50 assay. So here we are looking at the um, serum dilution that achieves 50% reduction in the number of plaques in set up in the well. And the normal range would be to have about 100 plaques uh, caused by SARS-CoV-2 virus in the wells where there was um, no serum applied. And you're looking for a reduction down to 50 plaques in the wells where diluted serum is applied. Uh, and this will be done over a six point or an eight point dilution range. And then the values will be used to calculate the ND50 or the IC50 titer. So um, here again, you can see that um, there is an immune response um, being generated uh, and that it's stronger after two doses than it is after one dose. Uh, there is some variation between the animals and that will be expected because these are outbred animals. This is using live SARS-CoV-2 virus. So this needs to be done in the containment level three lab, um, which means that there's a limit to the number of assays that can be run. However, um, it is often the case that if you look for correlation of other serological readouts with a live neutralization assay, you will find that they correlate very well. So having demonstrated correlation, it's possible in the future to use a different serological readout that doesn't require use of a containment level three laboratory for every single serum sample. So next slide, please. So on the right here, we have an example of that, a pseudotype neutralization assay where um, 
a virus other than SARS-CoV-2, but carrying the spike protein on its surface is used um, in the same way. And um, that doesn't require high containment and if done well, can be correlated with the neutralizing antibody assays. On the left is a micro-neutralization assay. And what that means is you are looking in a very rapid assay for the uh, reduction in the number of single infected cells after a 20 to 24 hour incubation. So instead of looking for reduction in plaques, you're looking for reduction in infected cells, which is essentially um, the same type of readout that can be done much faster and is more likely to be able to be automated both in setting it up and reading the results. And the next please. We also need to look at T cell responses and the assay that is most commonly used in clinical trials is the interferon gamma alley spot assay looking at um, cells which release interferon gamma in response to stimula stimulation with peptides spanning the whole of the antigen that's being included in the vaccine. Uh, and, and this is something that can be validated, standardized and um, rolled out quite easily. And the next slide is um, looking at intracellular cytokine staining, which can give you a lot more information about the release of different cytokines, but is much more difficult to standardize. And next, please. So in order to run these assays, we have certain requirements. We need protein, we need peptides. These should be the same across different labs. We need standards and controls. Negative and positive stand, uh, controls are standard in the calibrators to compare the assay. And we need core labs that are able to run these assays. Uh, so when we get into large scale clinical trials, we eventually reach a situation where we can truly compare like with like for assays measuring binding antibodies, neutralizing antibodies, and T cell responses. And I will stop there, thank you. Thank you, Professor Gilbert. Uh, our final speaker in this session on uh, immunity and, and, uh, and uh, vaccine-mediated enhanced disease is uh, Dr. Jeffrey Knowles from the uh, Oregon Health and Science University in the US. Uh, he focuses on T cells and cell trafficking uh, and uh, overall uh, function of the immune system. Uh, and he's gonna talk to us today about uh, long-term immune memory. So uh, Dr. Knowles. Thank you, Anita, and all the other organizers for putting together this uh, lovely discussion. Next slide, please. So, uh, you know, my lab uh, doesn't really focus on vaccine development per se, but uh, really has strong interests in understanding the basic mechanisms of T cell activation with a um, very strong interest in the development of long term immunological memory. And so, the graph I'm just starting off with here today. Um, is you can find in basically any textbook where this uh, illustrates the activation of the adaptive immune response, uh, in this case, the activation of cytotoxic CD8 T cells, where once those T cells are primed, they undergo this um, rapid proliferative expansion phase, um, differentiation into effector cells, followed by a contraction phase and the development of long-term memory. And if we want to start thinking about what are the features uh, 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 of immune cells that uh, um, are the fundamentals of memory T cells, they are listed there on the right. And so, of course, one aspect is that there's, there's more of these cells. They're gonna have immediate effector functions, which means they can produce cytokines and undergo cytotoxicity within seconds of re-encountering their antigen. These cells have different uh, tissue infiltrating capacities. Um, importantly, they are very durable and long-lived, and if, if uh, together these cells are able to then um, provide robust protection. Next slide, please. So in my lab, one of our favorite models to study is the use of a virus called Vaccinia virus, which is a large DNA virus of the pox virus family. Um, one reason we are interested in this is this is, of course, the smallpox vaccine. And so arguably, you could say this is the most successful vaccine in the history of mankind. So understanding the mechanisms that cause the activation of the adaptive immune uh, system downstream of this viral infection, we can start to understand what are the, what are the, 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 uh, um, the hurdles uh, that are going to be necessary to overcome 
to provide um, robust protection of immunity. Um, importantly, the, this is a virus that's very easy to work with, and so you can make recombinant versions of this virus that are able to express either model antigens or fluorescent proteins if you're interested in basic mechanisms of the laboratory, but also foreign antigens as a vaccine candidate. And the example I'm showing here at the bottom is the activation of the um, CD8 T cell response in response to a, a, a viral skin infection with vaccinia virus. And so if you just take naive black six mice and infect them on the skin with vaccinia, look seven days later, you can see in the drain lymph nodes, you have robust responses against the aminodominant epitope. In this case, it's the B8R2027 uh, 20, peptide. You get degeneration of circulating memory, as you can see in the spleen, and the cells can also traffic into the skin shown there on the right. Next question, or next slide, please. To demonstrate how um, effective the smallpox vaccine was. This is some um, data that a colleague of mine, Mark Slifka, out at the uh, Oregon Primate Center published quite a few years ago now. And it looked at the identification of immune cells that were specific to um, pox virus in individuals that were vaccinated up to 70 or 80 years earlier. Now, it's important to know that in 1980, of course, the eradication of smallpox was declared by the World Health Organization. In the United States, um, the smallpox vaccine was uh, stopped giving some, some, something around um, in the early 70s. And so the assumption here is that people aren't getting re-exposed to uh, pox viruses. And so this degeneration of these immune cells occurred strictly by the vaccination. And if you can see on the left graph there, um, the development of, of IgG antibodies against uh, pox viruses is incredibly stable in almost every individual. And the cellular immune response shown there in the, the right two graphs for the CD4 and CD8 T cells um, are generally stable as well. So um, we know that, that this is an effective vaccine. Um, it prevented disease and there's correlates with immune protection as we can see with T cell responses and humor responses. Next slide, please. So to get activation of certain types of immune cells, there needs to be, of course, antigen presentation. And so the activation of your cytotoxic CD8 T cell populations occurs primarily, uh, occurs through MHC class one present presentation, which uh, delivers antigenic peptides uh, into the ER through transportation of the TAP complexes and uh, presentation on MHC class one. Um, is, uh, and of course, uh, class two peptides are um, generally thought to occur by the uptake of exogenous antigens delivery of those peptides uh, from the endosome into an antigen processing compartment where they displace the clip peptide and then can be presented to CD4 T cells. And the activation of CD4 T cells is of course important because if you want to get um, high affinity class switched antibody, there needs to be the delivery of CD4 T cell help to activated B cells uh, in order for them to differentiate into long lived plasma cells that go onto the bone marrow. Next slide, please. So a few years ago, we were interested in understand, or trying to develop reagents that would um, activate CD4 T cells in vivo using the vaccinia system. And what we found is that if you um, deliver short peptides expressed by vaccinia that should be presented on class two, that system alone isn't sufficient to get robust T cell activation. And that's shown on the, the, the uh, second um, uh, histograms there, where if we infect mice with vaccinia expressing just a um, peptide from LCMV called GP61 using proliferation of CD4 T cells as a readout, there's no activation of these T cells in vivo. So we went to the literature and um, applied a couple strategies that are predicted to enhance um, MHC class two presentation. And that includes uh, flanking um, uh, peptide sequences uh, with either LAMP1 to target the peptide to the, to the lysosome, or by uh, conjugating it to the MHC class two invariant chain, which is predicted then to uh, pull that peptide into the uh, uh, antigen processing compartment. And as you can see, both of those strategies significantly enhance CD4 T cell activation in vivo. And, it, and in our hands, at least, the conjugation to the class two invariant chain seems to be the big winner. Next slide, please. So 
by by those what those data basically told us is that um, uh, we could maybe start applying these strategies to, of course, the SARS protein. And so there's just a simple schematic here of the of the the, the SARS spike protein with its S1 and S2 domains. Next slide, please. And so we went and uh, made some viruses that expressed either the, 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 the full length SARS coronavirus spike protein or SARS coronavirus spike protein uh, that uh, was conjugated via the variant chain. When we infected cells in vitro of these viruses, we got this kind of surprising or unexpected result where the virus expressing the whole length spike protein, we could clearly see expression in, in, in vitro, um, but we would not see the expression of the uh, of the virus that, it, that was attached to the invariant chain. Um, but you'll see in a couple of slides this, uh, maybe for other reasons. Next slide, please. So a simple, simple experiment we performed is we infected mites with either a vaccinia virus control, a vaccinia virus expressing the coronavirus spike protein or conjugated invariant chain, um, naive black six mice, and then we wanted to quantify the immune response that was mounted against those viruses. Next slide, please. Um, using some peptide pools shown here, um, and I want to focus down on the, the bottom two graphs, looking at the, T, this is the CD8 T cell response mounted against either um, what's uh, predicted down at epitopes of the full length S protein or the S1 domain. And you can see that both of our viruses, both the one that is expressing full length S as well as S conjugated to the variant chain, are both eliciting very strong CD8 T cell responses as shown by the production of interferon gamma. Um, next slide, please. And we are also able to monitor CD4 T cell responses. And so what basically these data show is that even though the, the, the coronavirus uh, spike protein conjugated to the invariant chain um, doesn't seem to be uh, stably expressed, it is clearly stimulating T cell responses in vivo. And so there is still this uh, prediction that um, there could be enhanced CD4 um, mediated um, uh, antibody production using this system. Next slide, please. And so this is, of course, early work for us, but we basically have shown that we could generate a recombinant vaccinia virus that express the SARS coronavirus through spike protein. Um, we show that the conjugation of the full length spike protein to the invariant chain may actually lead to more stabilization or degradation of the protein, and that we're currently investigating that. Um, immunization with the vectors, as we can show, activates both CD8 and CD4 T cells, and the dominant response may be against actually the S1 domain and not the S2 domain. And finally, the development of long-term immunological memory and neutralizing antibodies, of course, are currently ongoing in my lab. And um, thank you to the, everybody, and I'm all finished. Thank you very much, uh, um, uh, uh, Dr. Knowles. Um, so that concludes the four presentations. We are going to be uh, starting the panel discussion uh, now. Um, I am going to start off the panel discussion, and then we will get to the uh, lots of questions that we have in the in the query uh, section of this uh, uh, presentation. Um, let me start by, uh, so the well, so the trillion dollar question is, how do we get durable SARS to uh, COVID immunity with an acceptable uh, safety profile? Um, and uh, so I'm gonna pose the first question uh, to Dr. Gertz. Uh, can you uh, speak more broadly about what we are learning from animal models about vaccine efficacy uh, can we, do you think we will be able to prevent infection uh, in the upper airways, which then means that it's a transmission blocking vaccine as well? Or um, should we, can we only hope to get uh, prevention of severe disease, against severe disease? Uh, so could you, could you uh, address that question, please? So in our pre can you hear me there? Yeah. Okay. In our preclinical models, it looks like it's very, going to be very, very difficult to prevent uh, complete uh, viral replication in the upper respiratory tract. As I pointed out on this one slide there in the ferret model, one of the vaccine candidates that we have here seems to be highly effective in, in reducing viral in replication in the upper respiratory tract in most animals compared to the other one. So the type of immune response is critical. And, and I believe um, that you have to have a good combination of neutralizing antibodies as well as T cell immunity. I think neutralizing antibodies alone will not um, prevent um, viral replication in the upper respiratory tract. 
And so what can, what can animal models really offer? So I think that's one perspective. I think, um, you know, your question also um, suggests or, you know, like highlights that uh, immunity may be short lived for this one. So again, our animal models are, are now being used to look at duration of immunity. And, um, you know, unfortunately, not all the reagents are available for ferrets and hamsters. But um, I think it's the combination of the type of immune response um, and um, neutralizing antibodies that make the difference. Thank you. Uh, and Dr. Lewis, quickly uh, to you, uh, which animal models do you think are going to be uh, turn out to be most useful in understanding uh, safety issues, um, uh, vaccine mediated and health? Oh, that's a good question and, and something we've been sort of uh, discussing a lot. Uh, initially, even in my slide as reflected, we were initially going with the ferret models. We're working closely with, with Volker and the group at Vito. Uh, it looks like the hamster model uh, seems to get uh, a more fulsome disease with uh, maybe cor better correlative pathology. Most importantly, also, uh, they seem to lose weight uh, after infection, which is uh, you know, a great stable readout. Um, so I think, you know, as far as infection and challenge and, 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 I, and comparing with non-human primates, uh, the challenge models and non-human primates, uh, we don't have any direct experience with them yet, but they seem to be uh, pretty variable with, uh, with variable pathologic response. So, so in, in our group, we're, we're you know, thinking uh, about using hamster as a challenge model, uh, given, you know, given it's, it's more fulsome pathology and, and the weight loss, and then using, and as far as safety goes, uh, we're doing uh, all our safety studies in non-human primates. We feel this is the closest to, to humans. Great. Uh, thank you. Uh, so I have uh, so far 15 questions in the Q&A. Um, what I'll try and do is uh, um, pick, uh, pick uh, 16 uh, now. I'll pick ones that cover the whole session. Um, so let me, uh, I may not be able to do all of them, and, um, but I am told by the organizers that uh, the uh, panelists will have access to these questions and can get back to uh, people whose questions did not get answered. Um, so this is a question from Marion uh, Koopmans. Um, she's asking, other than specific neutralizing antibodies, is there a common understanding or consensus on what possible other immune correlates to study? including the potential for adverse effects. So this is, uh, again, a question for the first two uh, speakers. So again, I think um, the, the role of T cells is uh, gonna be critical. So T cell immunity, is, in my mind, um, is, is important for protection. Dr. Knowles, do you also wanna address this? Uh, because I, I think that there's, uh, uh, there is a lot of chatter about T cells. So, so I would say that, you know, uh, of course, in the media and stuff, everybody like wants to throw around that, of course, the development of neutralizing antibodies is the gold standard for vaccine efficacy. And we use that as a correlate for, for, for almost every type of vaccine. Um, and, you know, the T cells generally get ignored. And, and we know in, in many of our models, even in wild type mice, that if you get rid of memory T cells, even in the background of neutralizing antibodies, efficacy of immune protection gets lost. And so, you know, you can use neutralizing antibodies as a, as a readout for potentially the development of strong T cell responses, but knowing whether uh, either a cytotoxic T cell response or a CD4 helper T cell response is, is certainly gonna be almost certainly necessary. And that was what we kind of talked about in, in my presentation where how can we try and deliver antigens into one compartment or the other to boost those responses. Um, certainly uh, studies from uh, Stanley Perlman's group at Iowa can demonstrate that CD8 T cells can be sufficient to provide protection, um, whether they're necessary um, is, is something I don't know that we necessarily understand yet, especially against this novel coronavirus. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Gilbert, this question is for you from Manuel Barrel Neto. What are the planned correlates for protection for testing the proposed vaccine preparations? So um, during vaccine development, we should be looking at as many different immunoassays as possible. We obviously need a readout on neutralizing antibodies, 
but we're not going to be able to do neutralizing antibody assays on, um, hundred, on tens of thousands of individuals at multiple time points. So we need to be able to find something that correlates with that. And normally what you see, if you look at um, other vaccines that have been in development, it's possible to get a, a well standardized ELISA or another serology assay that doesn't require high containment that correlates well with the neutralizing antibody response. And that's most likely to be used as the eventual correlate of protection for that vaccine. But vaccine correlates of protection are vaccine specific. And if we only measure the serology response, we're ignoring the T cell response. So for any particular type of vaccine, whether it's a viral vector vaccine, a DNA vaccine, a protein subunit vaccine with a particular adjuvant, there will be a fairly standard relationship between the CD4, the CD8 T cell response, the ELISA titers, the binding antibodies that is, and the neutralizing antibodies. And that needs to be understood for each type of vaccine. Once we understand it, the eventual assay for correlative protection is likely to be something that's simple, easy to standardize, and easy to perform on a very large scale. And it will probably be a measure of binding antibodies, possibly to binding antibodies specific for the RBD domain in S1, but uh, or it could also be for the whole spike protein. Uh, uh, thank you. So, so um, for the benefit of our participants, a point that I would like to emphasize is it's really important to understand that this is going to depend on the type of vaccine, the uh, what platform you're using, and it's going to vary by. Uh, so we cannot probably will not be able to have one order of protection. It will depend on the platform. And uh, for a good understanding of this, um, the supplementary material in the NGM paper on Moderna is a is a is a good one to read through and compare to what the Oxford folks have uh, put out. Uh, there's another question for you, uh, Dr. Gilbert. This is from uh, Manoj Das. Um, you partly addressed this, but he, he has a second part as well. So for detecting the protecting protective antibody titer and vaccine efficacy, which antibodies are being considered? The antibody response in several infected individuals, so infected individuals uh, are low. What relevance does this have for vaccine efficacy testing? So the, the vaccine correlative protection needs to be determined in phase three trials of, of vaccine efficacy. We can't um, assume vaccine efficacy by reaching a particular level of antibody response of any type of antibody response. We need to actually determine efficacy um, in trials where we have uh, a control vaccine and um, the test vaccine and follow uh, subjects and count the cases. And then from that, once we have determined vaccine efficacy, then we work back to the corollas of protection for that particular vaccine. Um, and then we can start to think about whether that correlate may apply to other vaccines in development if they're of the same type. And it will give us some indication of the correlates for other vaccines as well. But um, as we've been talking about, if there's a strong T cell response, it may be that the neutralizing antibody titer required may be somewhat less than, than a different type of vaccine that gives neutralizing antibodies in the absence of a strong T cell response. Yeah, thank you. So I think that what the person is also trying to get at is that they're a little bit worried that uh, in convalescent uh, convalescent humans uh, recovering from disease that some some people have low uh, antibody levels. And what does, does that mean that we might have to do better than natural disease for protection? So the mechanism of, of induction of these immune responses is not necessarily exactly the same in people being infected with SARS-CoV-2 and people being vaccinated. And if you look at uh, vaccine trials using viral vector vaccines and DNA vaccines and other types of vaccines with other antigens where follow-up has extended for at least a year, we see good maintenance of antibody responses. So in particular, I can talk about the Chalux-1 MERS trial where we followed subjects up to a year and saw good maintenance of both T cell and antibody responses a year after a single vaccination. So that's not what we're seeing in people infected with SARS-CoV-2. It doesn't mean that we won't see good maintenance of antibody responses after vaccination. And we need to determine that, um, but we shouldn't be too um, despondent about the fact that an antibody responses seem to be declining quite quickly after infection. It's not necessarily going to be the case with vaccination. Great, thank you. Uh, so this question doesn't, uh, they did not tell us who they are, but the question is for Dr. Lois. Uh, says in 2007, an adenovirus-based anti-HIV vaccine step trial sponsored by Merck appeared to increase the rate of HIV infection in individuals with prior immunity against the adenovector used in the vaccine. Will the new platforms projected for COVID vaccine be tested for such adverse effects? 
this may concern the adenovirus based and possibly other DNA and RNA based formulations. Sure. Yeah. So, so I'm not um, intimately familiar with that particular study, but I think I think every vac vaccine developer is uh, is is aware of the enhancement studies and, and is uh, actively integrating them into their uh, testing plans. And I'm sure that's no different for the adenovirus or the other RNA or DNA platforms. Great. Uh, and then uh, there is another question uh, from Nesreen Ozeran. Um, any one of you can take this. Do you think this G614G mutation will affect the spike protein immunogenicity? Um, it's been shown that it doesn't. Antibodies that neutralize the original sequence neutralize 614G bearing spike proteins equally well. Okay. Um, <laughs> this is interesting. Also anonymous. Uh, Pfizer and Moderna vaccines showed reasonable level of mild to moderate adverse events in phase one. Is this a necessarily necessary evil to generate high titer neutralizing antibodies, or do we expect that the more traditional approaches, such as the pro adjuvanted protein vaccines, to generate a more suitable safety profile? I guess I'll have Dr. Lois address that. Yeah, well, so this is the issue with uh, with developing vaccines. The the very immune response we're trying to elicit uh, can sometimes have systemic effects. Um, so, so I think uh, I think you know this is potentially an an, uh, uh, an indication of efficacy. Although uh, there'll be maybe specific adverse events, uh, you know, that are specific to certain delivery systems and, and platforms. Um. Great. Uh, okay, and then one final one that I think we have uh, time for is um, for Dr. Knowles. What markers of T cell memory were used in the preclinical studies in the in the studies shown? Uh, are some evaluation of T cell memory available from the clinical studies already initiated? So, in some of the limited uh, stuff I've seen uh, from people like Shane Karate and Alejandro Cedre in, in La Jolla, um, can certainly uh, demonstrate using ex vivo peptide stimulations that there are both CD4 and CD8 memory generated in patients recovered from COVID 19. They use a variety of markers uh, in addition to cytokine production to demonstrate that biology. The other somewhat interesting thing that they showed in that uh, is a cell paper, if anyone wants to look it up, is that many uninfected people seem to have CD4 T cell responses that are presumably generated from other coronaviruses already present. And so this is somewhat of an interesting finding that perhaps um, the, the, there's cross reactivity in the CD4 compartment for, for SARS coronaviruses and also your, your, your more um, uh, widespread coronaviruses that, that give you seasonal cold, for example. But it didn't seem like that that was necessarily the same thing for the CD8 T cell response. And that actually might be somewhat interesting um, that, um, which also may suggest that you know CD8 immunity might be important for the prevention of reinfection of this type of virus. Sorry, one of the issues with the um, uh, and uh, Dr. Gilbert covered this a little bit. I mean, it's. It's so, there's so, uh, assay standardization is such a critical element and we are so, uh, so early in all of this, right? We're trying to so build the plane as we, are, as we are flying. And so T cell assay variability across the different, uh, uh, you know, we don't, we don't know how to, how to measure T cell response across uh, and compare across uh, constructs. Um, and, sorry, I think the other important point of here is that, that for people, we have to use blood as basically a marker of immunity. Whether the same immune response is present in non-lymphoid tissues yeah. is almost impossible to predict um, yeah. just based on that, that analysis. Yeah. So, so there's a lot of unknowns here right now. Uh, and only two days to be You're very difficult to hear at the moment. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, I'm saying only the phase, there's so much that's uh, unknown right now about this. And so only 
getting into the phase three trials and understanding how the candidate, uh, you know, how the, the different products uh, perform over time, uh, will many of these questions be uh, elucidated? Let me just pose this one uh, last question before we move into the rest, uh, rest. And this is to any one of you who wants to answer it. Um, what are the remaining gaps and what can GlowPedar members do to fill them? In our uh, sort of preclinical uh, preclinical space, uh, can you hear me? I can take a stab at that one. I think I think I think this has come up multiple times in the conversation. I mean, I think we need standardized standardized assays to determine correlates of protection, both for neutralizing antibodies and for cell-based responses. And I think, you know, as we move forward through clinical trials, these assays will be essential. How about in the clinical space, uh, Sarah? Oh, I was, gonna, I was just gonna say a bit more about preclinical space. So one thing okay. that we haven't right. really, where animal models can also help is in understanding transmission. So what we're seeing is when we have a macaque study where macaques are being exposed to a massive dose of virus, which is being delivered by multiple routes, uh, and then you see virus coming out of the nose. Actually, that still happens if you put dead virus into the nose. You can measure the same amount of viral shedding if you put irradiated virus into the nose of a macaque and follow the shedding over several days. So if we're doing vaccine studies which are designed for safety, and then we're seeing loss of viral RNA from the nose, that's not saying that that virus doesn't present transmission. So what we do need is a different setup for the animal model to look at transmission, um, having established safety, having established some degree of efficacy against disease in the, in the animal that's vaccinated, we then need other animal models to assess uh, will those vaccines prevent transmission if the animals who've been vaccinated are then challenged to co-house with naive animals. Okay, great. Any other quick response? Well, we're, we're out of time actually. So I mean, just a one, if I'll take a one minute from Dr. Gertz or uh, Dr. Knowles. Nothing really to add. I think um, determining the right, um, like the, the correlates to determine the right um, protective type of immunity is critical. And so again, standardization of T cell assays will be critical. Okay. Okay, with that, let me uh, move into session, uh, the second session of this, which is uh, manufacturing implementation and access, a uh, subject very close to my heart. Um, I will ask, um, uh, um, speaker here is Dr. Um, Yadav, uh, who will uh, talk to us about um, um, the, so yeah, he'll talk, about, talk to us about manufacturing. He's from, um, uh, he's a globally recognized scholar in the area of healthcare supply chains, has a PhD in management science, and currently is a senior fellow at the Center for Global Development professor at INSEAD and a lecturer at Harvard Medical School. So would love to hear your thoughts on um, uh, manufacturing, uh, Dr. Yadav. And this, these are, this is a super um, uh, fast session, five minutes per speaker. So we are challenged for time here. Thank you. Thanks, Anita. I'll try to be as uh, precise as, as possible. Next slide, please. So I think similar to uh, the state of affairs in global, uh, global collaboration and cooperation around science, colleagues who work on manufacturing science, so in, in a company, you know, people who lead the technical operations or tech ops or those in philanthropy or at CEPI who work on CNC have been working around the clock to understand what is the state of manufacturing capacity, where is it located, um, how much of it is available, how much of it will need to be reconfigured. So lots of important, relevant, but challenging questions. And what I'm hoping to do in the next three minutes is give you a quick overview of what our current understanding is. And when I say our, I imply that me as an academic who is largely observing much of this from the sidelines, um, this is a viewpoint that I'm, I'm sharing with you. So if we think of manufacturing capacity, I think it's worth thinking about three things in, um, which are very connected, but still somewhat separate. So the first is 
manufacturing capacity for drug substance. And second is manufacturing capacity for fill and finish operation. The third is availability of input materials, uh, including adjuvants, stabilizers, vials. And then the last is distribution capacity once we have uh, a vaccine manufacturer. And each of them is equally important. So let's start with drug substance manufacturing. We know this is highly platform dependent and the steps required change depending upon which vaccine manufacturer, which vaccine platform are we looking at and the degree of interchangeability and fungibility of manufacturing capacity from one platform to the other is very limited for certain kinds of platforms and is reasonably high for other platforms. So uh, what we've seen in the last three months is multiple deals, some of which have been executed bilaterally between a vaccine developer and uh, contract manufacturers. Uh, others which have been between multilateral organizations such as SETI or from country governments uh, in primarily the ones in uh, high income countries with specific vaccine developers to enable them to make at risk investments in, in capacity. Uh, the, the manufacturers or the vaccine developers have in turn contracted manufacturing capacity to CDMOs or, or contract manufacturers. And it remains unclear as to, to what extent can such capacity be quickly reconfigured in case that vaccine candidate does not meet um, our RTPP or, or the, the required efficacy and safety standards. And we want to then use that manufacturing capacity for an alternative candidate because we don't necessarily have the luxury to invest in um, capacity at full scale. And by full scale, I'm implying, you know, whatever is the, is the cohort size of 5 billion, 4.5 billion, some number uh, like that. So, so we do want the ability to, to, to use the same assets for the, the candidates which are more successful. So in that sense, it requires a portfolio approach to thinking about manufacturing capacity. And when we think about drug substance manufacturing, the other part that stands out is that for some of the newer vaccine platforms, the manufacturing capacity that either currently exists or the new production suits that are being put up based on the, the contracts that contract manufacturers have received, they are largely concentrated in a few countries, which are largely high income countries. Then when we look at uh, fill and finish manufacturing, you know, there we see a higher degree of uh, fungibility or interchangeability across candidates. Again, the, the capacity depends upon the type of packaging we, we have for a given candidate, which means if it's plus YL, is it BFS, is it something else? Uh, and also to some extent on the number of doses uh, to be uh, packaged in a, in, a, in a while. The fill and finish capacity is spread globally. I think it exists um, in, a, in a much wider global footprint than what we have for drug substance manufacturing. But the countries that stand out with large capacities in fill and finish are India, US, uh, China, and Europe. And the countries where fill and finish capacity does not exist or is in, in very small uh, dose equivalents are, are in Latin America, Africa, and Australia. Um, once again, I think if we look at fill and finish capacity in the aggregate, which means we look at what our projected global demand is and what is the aggregate availability of fill and finish, and this would include things such as uh, sterile and parental uh, manufacturing plants, which are not currently dedicated to vaccines, but are, are reconfigurable to make, uh, to do fill and finish for vaccines. If we include all of that, we have enough, most likely in the aggregate. But again, the important point here is that the aggregate can only fulfill global demand if we take the production out of the aggregate and then allocate it. But if we, if we think about individual geographical boundaries, then clearly we may not have sufficient fill and finish capacity. The other part to keep in mind is that while a lot of public dollars have gone into creating capacity through contracting, um, we still are not sure if auxiliary inputs, especially vials, um, and in some cases, adjuvants, do we have sufficient capacity for that? And is uh, our companies investing in building capacity at risk without necessarily having commitments 
from the vaccine developer and the contract manufacturer uh, or from public agencies. Um, and so that's an area where I think we, we probably need to do um, some more work. Uh, and then the, the last thing is um, a, a question mark, which is if we have um, fill and finish manufacturing capacity and we resolve our vaccine manufacturing constraints, then we would still be faced with a, a big challenge in terms of cold chain storage and distribution capacity, which is something that shouldn't be necessarily decoupled from our questions about vaccine manufacturing capacity. So I have uh, four things that I want to conclude with. One is it's important to look at supply network coordination at the portfolio level, which means the ability to change manufacturing sites, production suites from one vaccine candidate to another as we learn more about phase three study results, as we learn about new, as new information becomes available, that ability to change uh, will be extremely important to match our limited capacity with a, a wide and, and growing portfolio of vaccine candidates. Then I think we need uh, better purchasing coordination and equitable allocation rules so that we can resolve the regional imbalances that exist in fill and finish manufacturing. Uh, we, we need greater demand side predictability so that uh, the, those, those vaccine developers who have not received a direct grant from CEPI or from uh, any of the, the bilateral country national government mechanisms do see what is the demand at the end of this. And the, and the, the three things that we ought to focus on there is better demand forecasting, uh, using some kind of advanced purchase commitments and certainly pool purchasing because when the demand is fragmented across multiple smaller countries, it becomes harder for a, a vaccine developer to um, convince their investors that yes, this is worth investing in manufacturing capacity already. And then the, the use of development finance, which is um, whether it is IFC or UK CDC or um, other such development finance institutions uh, can they provide capital for scaling up manufacturing? I'll pause there and, and um, yeah, any questions, comments, or even uh, insights that colleagues want to share, welcome that. Thank you. Back to you, Nita. Thank you, Dr. Yadav. I hope you can stay for the whole session because we do have time for the questions at the end. We're bunching up the two presentations and then we'll come back to you. That's a, a very fascinating and there's so many issues to talk about here. So, um, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, so we will go to Dr. James Love. Uh, who is going to load his presentation. There it is. Uh, uh, he's the director of Knowledge Ecology International and uh, his training is in economics and finance. And he is, uh, uh, his focus is on financing of research and development, intellectual property rights, prices for and access to new drugs, vaccines, and other medical technologies. Uh, Dr. Love. Uh, you're muted still. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, uh, I'm not a doctor, so I just wanted to clear that up. <laughs> um, I'm going to share, share some slides on my screen. And uh, put this into a present mode. Can you? Uh, we can uh, see you. We can, can see, see you. the slides right now. Okay. Yes, we can. Uh, very good. Okay, I'm going to, uh, our organization, uh, it was started in 2006. Uh, we really incorporated work that was uh, from another organization. We, we spun off from and we kind of redefined the, the nature of the mission. We focus really on the way knowledge is managed. We have offices in Washington, D.C. and Geneva, Switzerland. Our work on access to medical technology is funded by the Pearls Foundation, the Open Society Foundation, Kaiser, and uh, Unitate. Uh, the, um, uh, I want to start with very uh, briefly with this issue, this, this issue of what constitutes a public good. And I mention this because uh, there have been a number of interventions by governments and by NGOs, such as Doctors Without Borders or the South Center, MSF, uh, uh, leaders of certain heads of state, where they've talked about the idea that a vaccine should be a global public good. Uh, it was actually brought up in the WHO negotiations uh, in the resolution they had at the World Health Assembly on COVID-19 about whether or not the term uh, in these UN discussions, if, if vaccines should be described as a global public good. And in, in those cases, the U.S. 
and some other countries objected because they said that term was not well defined. And uh, uh, there was a distinction that was drawn between the know-how of, uh, or, or I should say, a vaccination itself, which was perceived to have a global public characteristic. That's bu 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 characteristic. Well, the, the idea being that if everyone is vaccinated, everyone, or the more people are vaccinated, the, the greater the benefit for the world. But there was some argument about whether the vaccines themselves as products would be considered a global public good. And that came down to really um, uh, to an old discussion uh, by uh, an economist who won a Nobel Prize, uh, pa Paul Samuelson, for a paper he wrote a very long time ago in 1954, where he defined what he described as a pure public expenditure as something that was non-rival in consumption and not excludable. And he used examples, people have used examples for th as things such as lighthouses, national defense, outdoor circuses, a very limited set of goods. But the idea, if you have something where the number of people that consume it doesn't affect the supply uh, or it doesn't create shortages uh, and you can't exclude people from having it, then it would have this, 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 this characteristic. And it was really designed I mean, a lot of you aren't economists. I have my backgrounds in economics, so this become a big, huge problem in the policy wonk field of people that do economics. But they 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 feel kind of awkward about this term now. Most ordinary people that don't don't read these, the old economic literature, um, they think global public goods are just things that governments do, and I think that's the right definition. I just wanted to point out that in there's a, a fair amount of misunderstanding of Samuelson's earlier definition, he was describing what he considered a particular extreme case, but not the only cases that something could be defined as a global public good. And he's made that very clear in his writings. And, uh, and, I, and I've written about this recently, and I have a citation at the bottom of the slide for a recent article on this. Now, I want to talk briefly about the, uh, the, the World Health Organization's, uh, uh, they have a, a, a COVID-19 technology access pool that they've tried to create. Uh, it kind of launched it basically in May. Um, it was uh, designed to provide the global pooling of rights and inventions, copyrights, designs, data, cell lines, and know-how, which is a very broad definition of intellectual property or things related to intellectual property. And they wanted to apply to all types of COVID-19 technologies, not just vaccines, but everything from protective equipment, and diagnostic tests, and therapeutics as well. It is, as you know, and uh, it, uh, this is an, your, your own group is one of many international initiatives right now that related to both the research and access to COVID-19 technologies. I list a few of them on this slide, and there's, there's more, certainly, including uh, your group and others as well. And then there's a whole series of national initiatives, or uh, sometimes described as bilateral initiatives on this area. Uh, and I think this is... Uh, uh, an interesting part of the whole of the whole effort on how you finance and how you manage the uh, uh, the access. Uh, we've had discussions with countries trying to uh, engage them about what their policies might be on access or what kind of collaboration they might be with the WHO. I think that most of the action has not been at the WHO on the IP front. Uh, it, 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 you know, there's been a discussion at the WHO that's primarily about who gets access to products without a lot of detail about how rights and patents or rights and data or rights and know-how are really managed. There's sort of the idea that those things are sort of addressed in these other initiatives, uh, 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 for example, through CEPI or the work that you're doing or other areas. But I'd have to say it's, it's relatively fragmented. And the WHO effort to create kind of a central global discussion on the IP front through CTAP has not gone very well. And also they have not done a very good job of distinguishing what the CTAP is compared to other things that are going on. In particular, the WHO has this uh, uh, COVID-19 tools, you know, accelerator, the, the so-called ACT accelerator, uh, and it has a big focus on who gets what in terms of the products, and that has received a far, far more attention and far more high-level endorsements from national governments than anything having to do with patents or intellectual property. Now, we think that the sharing of, of uh, 
products, uh, uh, the sh our shortages of products and the hoarding of products is, is just, it's bad, but we think it's going to be somewhat inevitable. I mean, it's, we sometimes start by saying if Germany is 1% of the global population and they have a vaccine developed in Germany, it's un, un, unlikely that Germany is going to export 99% of the vaccine. And I think that's true, not just for Germany, but certainly for the U.S. They've demonstrated that through President Trump's actions. And I think all countries are looking at the AMC and these preferential purchasing agreements as a way of having some kind of guarantee that they get a certain amount of product. And, uh, you know, I, I, don't, I, I don't want to endorse that kind of activity, but we think it's just going to happen. But what we really think should not happen is supporting the know-how and how to make vaccines or the rights uh, that you need um, in terms of rights and patents, data, access to cell lines and things like that that are necessary. Now, in the U.S., which I'll, where I'm located primarily, uh, uh, we have a, uh, a national law and, and we're one of the big funders, as you know, on vaccine development. Um, the, the U.S. normally has an, uh, a law called the Bayh-Dole Act, which sets out some rights the government has and things that we fund, including the, the obligation to make fun, uh, products available on reasonable terms, government ro royalty free rate, and other things. However, uh, under the Trump administration uh, and, and the actions of the Congress, bipartisan action of the Congress, we've created a brand new, or a, I shouldn't say brand new, but a different legal authority for funding vaccines that's being used a lot right now called Other Transactions Authority, or OTAs. Under these OTAs, uh, the BARDA and the NIH are able to circumvent the public interest rationales on pricing and access and competition that would normally apply on a federal government grant or contract. And they've written contracts which have restricted the federal government's rights, privatized more of the research that we fund, and eliminated some of the obligations that we've had on pricing. Um, and that's something that we've done a fair amount of work on and we're, we're very active in the U.S. on. Uh, I would say for vaccines, it, it's our, it, it, as I'm sure people here are really deeply aware, any type of technology transfer should be begun early. I, I think the previous presentation was really helpful because it, it, it emphasizes the fact that the different platforms have different, they're, you know, they're not all in the same boat in terms of what's possible in terms of tech transfer, in terms of manufacturing, in terms of how, uh, what the capacity is international. But we think that all the people that are funding research and development, whether it's BARDA, with the NIH, with the Canadians, the Germans, the Japanese, the Chinese, anyone that's, the, the Italians, everyone that's working on vaccines, we think they should have, as part of their uh, uh, program, a, a, a commitment to and a plan for to have deep technology transfer the manufacturing. So to the extent that things are ready to roll out, it, 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 there's not huge delays in the scaling up of, uh, of, compet of other manufacturers, and there's just no monopolies, but not also no, no, t you know, no unnecessary time delays. That's not really happening right now, in our opinion. We think there's... Uh, a high level of rhetorical support uh, for access, but we think when it comes to issues of patents, there was an editorial in the Washington Post, I think, yesterday that was signed by, I think, seven heads of state, including, uh, uh, you know, Trudeau from Canada, uh, about, you know, how everything has to be equal globally, and, and that was great. And there was a statement that Gavi put out about, uh, about you know, making vaccines available everywhere. But none of these statements have really mentioned patents. Uh, or the IP rights and the data or the know-how that are necessary. And I think that's, that's it, it's, it's, it's really a bad thing that in a COVID-19, in a big pandemic, you can't actually talk about these things plainly since they're, they're obviously critically important. Um, uh, incentives, if needed, uh, can be delinked from the uh, monopoly and the prices through things like market entry rewards. And this is my final slide. Um, so what is the WHO? Uh, COVID-19 access pool have to do. Um, and uh, that would be that we'd, we'd have to, uh, well, we, we think they should be making concrete asks to the people that are funding R&D and manufacturers and other right holders uh, for the sufficient rights to the inventions, data, materials, and, and, and making requests for deep commitments on technology transfer. It's, it, it, we're unhappy about the fact that we're in July and the WHO has yet to describe what it actually wants in practical terms for people to share with its pool. 
people barely even know about the pool. And, they're, and, and they've had off-the-record conversations, but they haven't had transparent written conversations that, that make the governments and the funders and the companies more accountable for saying, are you in or are you out on this kind of a deal? Uh, I think they're in some, in many respects, I think they've been intimidated by pressures are perceived are real that they think are coming from the US, Germany, the UK, the Gates Foundation, in some cases, Japan, other companies, uh, Sweden, that, have, that, have, that, are, that have, have taken very aggressive positions in the past in WHO negotiations on issues involving intellectual property. Um, you want me to wind up? Is that why you're interrupting my video here? Um, uh, not interrupting, uh, I'm just giving you a message. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, I, I uh, 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 and the last thing I will say is that I think that we're very concerned about the lack of transparency on these issues. I think uh, in a pandemic, in a national emergency, governments should avoid secrecy on things that are critically important. We should know what is in the, con in the funding contracts. They should be transparent. They shouldn't be secret. They shouldn't be heavily redacted, and they are. And I'll just stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, 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 James. The, um, th those are significant issues, and I hope that we will have a chance to cover them in the in the panel discussion. Um, I wanted to say a few words about uh, how Covax is thinking about uh, equitable access, and then we go go into the panel discussion. Um, so, as uh, uh, can you all hear me? Okay, so um, as Deborah uh, Yersky from CEPI described in her presentation earlier uh, today, COVAX uh, is the vaccine pillar of Act A, uh, the, the access to COVID tools accelerator that a bunch of uh, global health organizations as well as some high income countries um, uh, supported, uh, especially um, WHO and EC, European Commission um, uh, sponsorship was put together uh, and uh, with the, the goal to accelerate uh, COVID-19 tools and equitable access to COVID-19 tools. Despite all of the nationalist uh, headwinds that uh, we read about and hear about um, uh, every day, um, and uh, uh, James uh, Love was uh, also alluding to, um, a problem, of course, is that the whole world is affected by this pandemic right now. So every country feels like I need to take care of my citizens first. So, in, so this has been extremely complicated, um, bringing people together, uh, bringing organizations together, bringing countries together. How, how do we uh, um, uh, raise money uh, for equitable access? Um, and for uh, COVAX has now come up with the very ambitious goals that you heard about uh, 100 million doses by the end of 2021 and 2 billion doses for the world by the end of, so, uh, two, uh, 100 million doses by the end of 2020 and 2, uh, and 2 billion doses by the end of 2021. Now, how much is that going to cost? Well, there is an investment case now and it's going to cost $20 billion. So it's a huge amount of money and it's, it's very hard to raise in a very short period of time. Why do we need so much? Um, well, we need it for R&D. Many of these candidates are still early stage. They need to get into uh, advanced clinical development. We need to do at-risk manufacturing, which basically, which is the only way that we can, uh, we can compress timelines, right? In normal vaccine development, first you will, um, you know, do your, uh, get your phase three data, and then you will do commercialization. Here, um, we have to start making the vaccine or start manufacturing the vaccine before we have uh, phase three data or even phase two data to be able to have enough doses by the time we want them uh, in 2020 and 2021. And many of those um, doses will be wasted because the vaccine might not work. So we have to pay, um, we have to pay uh, uh, money upfront to make vaccines without knowing whether those vaccines will work or not. And finally, we need money to procure vaccines for LMIC, for low, middle, low, low income countries and low middle income countries. Um, and so, and all of that money is needed in the next few months to be able to uh, complete the R&D for multiple candidates, uh, manufacture hundreds of millions and billions of doses uh, in the next 12 to 18 months, 
as well as to uh, be able to deliver those vaccines. So procurement and delivery costs uh, conservatively are estimated at $20 billion. Uh, so um, uh, what I would, this is a very live conversation right now, figuring out how to do this. And there are multiple uh, um, uh, scenarios that are being uh, uh, considered as potentially viable, including development finance uh, funding or charging a premium to the high income countries to subsidize the um, at-risk manufacturing as well as uh, low middle income and low income uh, country purchase. Um, and uh, uh, th uh, some of those conversations are actually happening today and we will uh, know by next week how much progress has been made. Let me stop there and open up for questions. Uh, and my first uh, question will be uh, to uh, Dr. Um, Yadev. Uh, and uh, I want to ask, how are you thinking about um, uh, what kind of risks are involved in at-risk manufacturing? Um, if we have phase one uh, data, let's say, uh, we have phase one data um, and um, investments are made or, or money is given to six or seven different companies, let's say, uh, to make a product at risk without knowing their, uh, their uh, clinical uh, uh, information. How do you think about how many should we be investing in at risk? Uh, is there enough capacity there to do all of this? How much of this capacity is fungible? You refer to that a little bit. Um, and uh, how much of it is likely to get lost because the product didn't work? So lots of questions. Uh, I know you have to leave at 10, so I'm gonna put them all together. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thanks, Anita. So uh, I don't know if I have answers to all of the questions and I think the, the meeting that you described and other things that are happening are, are, are gonna get us some closer to, to those answers. But I think uh, what's important to recognize is that we are doing or we are trying to do two things at risk. One is having some stock manufactured at risk after some early phase one data. And the second is to have manufacturing capacity ready to start production when we have um, results from phase three. Right? So those are two things which are very closely connected, but in a way it's worth thinking about them as separate. So I think for the first one, which is building some uh, stock at risk, I think for all candidates which are in clinical trials, um, depending upon the size, which means, you know, are you talking about having a million doses ready uh, or having five million doses ready? And that's what gives us the answer to, would we do it with all 10 candidates? Would we do it with five or six? But once again, it depends upon a very good portfolio analysis. And this is something that uh, a few colleagues and I have, have, have started working on very recently, where it's important then to understand what is the probability of success matrix looking like? And most importantly, what are the covariance and correlations between different candidates? So is it negatively correlated to the success of one? Is it positively correlated uh, or it's not correlated? And that will help us answer the question of, should we invest in building 5 million doses of six candidates or should we invest in doing that for all 10 or for three? The, the capacity question is slightly easier in that sense, which is we don't require exclusively putting um, grant money out or contractual money out for building capacity. It would be a combination of grant and, and contractual monies, but also greater visibility and transparency of demand, which will then incentivize the the, the companies to self-invest in capacity. So that's the part that's embedded in the advanced market commitment or the advanced purchase agreements. So through the combination of those two, I think we will have sufficient capacity. Um, the, the key question becomes the coordination mechanism so that where we do have fungibility, how can we very quickly reconfigure a contract manufacturer's capacity, which is allocated to candidate A uh, to candidate B. And there it's, you know, there are two things that come to play. One is uh, the contractual agreements are between the developer and the contract manufacturer are not transparent, like I think Jamie was pointing that out. Uh, the second is that there are also IP clauses in some of the cases. We've seen one example where the supplier of clinical material 
believes that they own a portion of the IP in the clinical material that they, they had co-developed with a, with a vaccine developer. So I think that's another element to keep in mind, how do we coordinate um, the, the network? And I think that's where we look to COVAX as the, the group or the umbrella structure which can do this, uh, working in collaboration or in, in close concert with some of the national governments who've gone ahead and make that, made their own investments. Uh, thank you. Let me ask you another one, which I, I think will be helpful for our participants to understand. Let's say that there isn't enough uh, vaccine manufacturing capacity, and there probably isn't to immunize everybody with two doses around the world in the next two years. Um, how does one increase manufacturing capacity? How long does it take? Um, what are the options there? Yeah, so I think, again, depends upon the, the stage of manufacturing. So I think for uh, for bioreactor capacity, we are at a stage where for certain platforms, it can be done relatively quickly, given that we, we, we do start, we have started using these single use uh, bioreactors and things which are easy to bring online. For fill and finish capacity, which I, I at least believe we have sufficient, but in case we need more, I think it takes a slightly longer timeline to bring that up. Um, but there might be there might be opportunities to do so. When we think about building capacity, we think about do we set up a greenfield plan, which means start from yeah. scratch, or do we build a brownfield plan, which is add a production suite or add a new facility or a line to an existing plant? And uh, we certainly don't have the luxury of building greenfield plants because they would take you know two to three years. But with a very compressed timeline, we can have brownfield plants which can come up to start producing between six to 12 months time. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Uh, uh, sorry, um, uh, James uh, Love, uh, can I switch to you now and uh, ask you um, um, question related to, this is indirectly related to what you talk, but it's kind of a, how I think about risk mitigation of in the, the kinds of problems that you're describing related to IP. Um, how do you think about, um, uh, for example, the global scientific community and funders are right now funding multiple candidates um, to get across the finish line so that there is uh, enough, uh, so there isn't a monopoly. Right? There isn't a, a, a and uh, for many of them, it is public uh, funding. Of course, the US is a hotel cold, different ball game, but from uh, in other countries, where there is, um, there are what we call global access uh, clauses where the product has to be provided at low cost uh, to um, uh, 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 developing countries. So how do you think about how do you think about that? Well, I think it's it's good when there's uh, you're talking about the products. So when there are provisions in the funding agreements, uh, and, we, and and there are of course. <laughs> Uh, and, you know, there's been a lot announced just yesterday on this front, which was very positive. Um, it's, it's a good thing. Uh, you know, I, I think the, uh, it's interesting that the Advanced Purchase Fund is a, is a, a bit of a mixed, uh, uh, yeah, I, I, that, I know that that's endorsed very much. The Gavi's, you know, been very engaged in that, that the Harvard Group, uh, uh, Michael Cromer, the Gates Foundation, is very keen on the Advanced Purchase Fund. Uh, uh, Fund things. The problems with those for developing countries is just it allows people that have more financial resources to stake out bigger claims. In theory, I know there's policies designed to mitigate that. Um, uh, so I think those those are positive. I think that the the lack of transparency in all of these things is is problematic for us. I mean, I know that I'm not I'm not criticizing the Gavi policies on this, but I'm just sort of saying at the national government level, um, um, we had a we had a uh, I, I, I think partly the governments are like, like the Oxford contract, for example, with uh, AstraZeneca, which is quite important. Uh, uh, Oxford has been willing to give off the record briefings on some of the details to, uh, to some of the NGOs that are making inquiries, but they won't show them anything in writing and everything is kind of like, you know, in some kind of like, you know, you know zoom call that's, that, that isn't public. And I think that, uh, Everything about the quantities, the prices, and the IP 
should be public. And we can we should be able to have adult conversations about 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 what's going on in this area. But but the reasons why they're not public is in some countries they think is like a national security interest. I think the UK government probably intervened in the in the Oxford case because they just sort of see it as a matter of national security for the UK to have some kind of uh, some kind of preferential access to the products. And uh, and of course everyone's thinking the same way. What what the problem for everyone is is that no one knows who's going to cross the finish line. First, right? As you mentioned, that there's lots of products, there's lots of vaccines under development. To the extent you get everyone to commit to putting their cards on the table and everyone committing to doing the kind of uh, 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 brownfield kind of uh, kind of uh, technology transfer where it's where it's possible, depending on the platform, it, it just seemed like it would be in everyone's interest to do that. You just hedge your bets. Is it going to be the Chinese? Is it going to be the Italians? Is it going to be the Germans? The UK, the US, the Canadians? I mean, who knows, right? So, so uh, it, unfortunately, people are 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 are, are uh, 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 just not transparent because they don't they 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 they, 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 they don't want to expose whatever preferential uh, agreements that they have, and they're also still in some ways. Uh, and I, certainly, the, the feeling of WHO is Germany is going this way. Is there's some kind of industrial policy thing going on where they think they can make money off the vaccine, and uh, and that's really, I think, unfortunate. Okay, thank you. I think that's all we'll have time for. There are there are other questions in the in the in the question and answer. If you, uh, Dr. Yadav and and uh, Jamie Love, uh, if you have time to address them later on, that would be great. We would not have time to cover them today. I think most of those were covered in your responses anyway. I can um, very much uh, in a, agree that uh, uh, our current, uh, we will only solve this problem by all of us working together, right? And if we can't do that, this is going to be a very hard problem. We, uh, it, it'll be impossible to end this pandemic. And um, and uh, so it's, it is a call to action from uh, GlobalDAR that uh, countries and uh, scientists and manufacturers, everybody needs to work together to solve this together. Okay, let me, uh, now we are um, running one minute late and I'm going to pass it on to my uh, colleague and co-chair, Dr. Deborah Yaski, to close out with the last and final session of uh, today uh, on um, clinical trials and regulatory con uh, consideration. So over to... Uh, uh, Dr. Yersky, thank you. Thanks, Anita. And um, I have to apologize for my technical difficulties uh, at the beginning of uh, the meeting here. Um, it was sort of maybe like a, a drop the mic uh, a scenario uh, when I was done. But I'm, um, I'm very glad to uh, host this session of clinical trials and regulatory considerations. Um, and so in the interest of time, I will um, uh, give the floor over to uh, a colleague of mine at CEPI, Amal Chaudhry. Um, he is uh, currently uh, the clinical development lead at CEPI uh, in London. And before uh, CEPI, he was at uh, the Serum Institute in India as a medical and operations lead for clinical trials for vaccines. Amal? Uh, thanks, Deborah. Uh, I hope uh, my voice is clear. Uh, so thank you for the introduction, Deborah, again, and opportunity. Uh, thank you for the opportunity uh, the organizers have given me today to present some thoughts on the consideration for efficacy endpoints in uh, COVID-19 vaccine clinical trials. So I'll focus my talk on four broad elements, starting with uh, the preference of um, symptomatic COVID-19 as a, as a primary outcome of interest, as opposed to uh, SARS-CoV-2 infections. And I think this comes from our historical learnings uh, with other respiratory virus vaccines, which tend to impact more on the severe disease, mortality, and ICU hospital admissions, as opposed to, say, uh, mild disease or, or symptom symptomatic infections. Next, I want to touch upon the uh, choice of primary endpoint in, in terms of uh, symptomatic COVID, uh, COVID disease, but which, uh, which severe, like all severity COVID-19 or uh, just uh, focusing on moderate, severe or critical uh, COVID-19. Uh, third point about the positive predictive value of the uh, COVID-19 associated symptoms uh, uh, and, their, uh, and their importance in triggering uh, uh, nasopharyngeal swabbing for PCRs during trials. And finally, uh, uh, the, uh, a bit about asymptomatic infection and its importance as a uh, vaccine efficacy endpoint in the in the context of especially the reliability of 
uh, available as is. So if you could go to the next slide, please. Uh, so as we heard previously as well today that uh, uh, the, I mean, the respiratory viruses or the COVID-19 uh, vaccines are likely to behave uh, similar to other uh, respiratory vac uh, virus vaccines such as influenza or uh, rotavirus, the mucosal uh, uh, virus vaccine. In, in the sense that uh, they may not block the infection fully and the recipients would still have some mild residual symptoms, uh, but it, is, it, is ha it will have more impact on, on severe disease uh, and, and progression of the disease. We have seen at least one, uh, one animal study from uh, one of the vaccine candidates, which showed that, uh, you know, uh, uh, challenged uh, non-human primates um, uh, were protected from severe disease despite uh, showing milder symptoms. But of course, this is just one animal study and we should always be cautious when trying to interpret these results and translating into uh, humans. There is, however, a consensus evolving around the globe among various stakeholders such as WHO and even the other trials that are looking for efficacy as primary endpoint uh, in choosing COVID-19, symptomatic COVID-19 as the uh, primary, uh, primary endpoint uh, uh, as opposed to SARS-CoV-2 infection uh, when looking for COVID-19 vaccine efficacy. So if you could uh, go to the next slide, please. Uh, there is, however, some uh, still some debate on what, what does a, a, a symptomatic COVID-19 as a primary endpoint looks like in a, uh, in a clinical trial protocol, for example. Uh, so just, just, to, uh, just a couple of uh, uh, scenarios here I'm presenting that you know, there could be more options here, but to start with, as, as, as a comparison, one way of uh, doing it is any severity COVID-19, uh, which would be uh, which would be which would be uh, preferable uh, in low incidence settings where, for example, the uh, peak of the uh, of the epidemic has probably passed, and one can afford to enroll younger and less uh, vulnerable trial populations since they would pre present with the entire spectrum of severity uh, and you know help in uh, uh, gathering the cases faster. But there is a risk of, uh, uh, you know, uh, including vaccine attenuated disease. Like, uh, if 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 the vaccine only prevents disease progression, then the vaccine recipient should still present with milder disease, and uh, that gets counted in your primary efficacy analysis, which may impact the uh, vaccine efficacy estimates. On the other hand, if if one uh, chooses to go with uh, what I'm calling here as moderate to critical COVID-19, as defined by WHO. Uh, which requires the presence of uh, pneumonia and new, uh, sim signs and symptoms of pneumonia. And this could uh, allow, uh, you know, in, in uh, more useful in, say, high incidence settings and, uh, you know, you could enrich your populations with, with, the, with the trial population, with, with the population that is more vulnerable to this kind of severe disease, such as older and uh, other uh, maybe comorbidities, uh, morbidities, sorry. Uh, this may also allow the developer to uh, exclude cases of uh, vaccine attenuation, uh, thereby again maybe uh, maybe uh, hastening or you know speeding up the achievement of vaccine efficacy estimates. Uh, if you could go to the next slide, please. Uh, this slide and the slide after this, what I'm trying to present is the diversity uh, that again exists in in terms of uh, you know define the, defining the severity of COVID. Uh, as well as COVID as a case itself, uh, and what constitutes the signs and symptoms that go into uh, uh, into defining this uh, uh, this uh, symptomatic COVID per se. So, if you go to the next slide, please. Uh, and these are the symptoms of COVID. And if you see, like you know, uh, there are various uh, guidances available uh, here. Of course, the US CDC and European CDC focuses on the surveillance of uh, uh, for surveillance purposes, but uh, the Symptoms, signs, and symptoms that are associated with COVID are uh, are, are variable, and very, various organizations uh, uh, have included, and which is which is not surprising actually. I mean, we are learning about this disease as we go along, and uh, you know, this the information is still evolving. But what this creates is a dilemma for a vaccine developer during the con trial conduct uh, in trying to define their case definition. Uh, and there may be a case, uh, as I've made a point here on the slide, that uh, there may be a case of uh, considering a clinical ed endpoint adjudication committee as well in the in the efficacy trials. But by the way, just to clarify, when I say COVID-19 here, it may not be explicit, but what I'm implying is uh, virologically confirmed COVID-19 via uh, RT-PCR. 
so if we go to the next slide please uh, uh, similar to this there's a, a dilemma of uh, when to when to trigger a case workup or that is nasopharyngeal swabbing and pcr uh, in a clinical trial whether if a, if a participant shows any of the symptoms listed above or you stick to more specific indicative covid 19 symptoms for example, maybe a fever, cough, dyspnea, or anosmia, agasia. In the former case, there is a likelihood that you might uh, overburden or overload your testing capacities, uh, especially if the trial is happening in very high incidence settings and where you know subjects turn up with febrile episodes every every other month. And uh, if if you coincide with say flu season, and then you get a lot of uh, flu-like symptoms, which then need to be tested for PCR. Uh, on the other hand, if, if you uh, choose only a, a more a stricter or a higher threshold and go for PCR swabbing only in case of indicative symptoms, there is a chance that you may miss out on a few atypical cases, which could delay the achievement of uh, vaccine efficacy endpoint. What could help here uh, is an exercise where you try to determine the positive predictive value of uh, especially non-specific symptoms uh, when they are seen in isolation without the concurrent uh, specific COVID-19 symptoms. So uh, if you go to the next slide, please. And to wrap up uh, the final point about infection, uh, especially asymptomatic infection, which we heard earlier could be very important in the context of uh, preventing transmission. But when, when assessing asymptomatic infection in a trial, it could be very challenging that you may need weekly uh, swabbing and PCRs, which is not just costly, but is further complicated by the specificity of, of, the, of the test where if it, if it reduces by even 0.1%, for example, you would get hundreds of false positive results, which again can skew your vaccine efficacy estimates. An alternative way is to look uh, for antibodies against an antigen which is not part of the vaccine. For example, if it is an, uh, an anti-spike vaccine, then you maybe do uh, anti and antibodies at uh, specific time intervals. Uh, but it, this is also complicated by a couple of things in terms of the sensitivity. Uh, if it is low, then it could uh, bias it towards a null hypothesis. Uh, then again, we are not really sure about the persistence of anti and antibodies uh, and how, and there are some reports which say that, you know, it could be less sensitive in mild and asymptomatic cases. Uh, so if you go to the last slide uh, after this, which I just want to highlight those points again and maybe this could be uh, a kickstart, kickstart the discussion uh, around these uh, going ahead. So uh, thank you. That, that's it. Deborah, are you on mute? Okay, it looks like uh, Deborah has had an inconsistent uh, connection for a while, so it's Charu here, and I'm going to introduce the next speaker, who is Gagandeep Kang from uh, CEPI, India. She's also from the Christian Medical College in India, and she's going to talk to us about the COVID-19 vaccine development requirements for clinical trial sites and regulatory considerations in LMIC. So Gagandeep, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you very much, Charu. Can we have the next slide, please? So if we take a look at a map of clinicaltrials.gov and the trials that are registered, you can see that some parts of the world have many more trials than others. Now, clinicaltrials.gov is not the only primary clinical trials registry, but it is telling that places in the world that have lower clinical capacity are the ones that do less clinical research. A while ago, it was thought that because uh, countries, developing countries, LMICs, had access to very large populations, they would be great places to do clinical trials. And there were a number of clinical research organizations, researchers, from academic backgrounds and from industry, who came to sites that had national regulatory authorities 
that were reasonably placed or at least places where WHO recognized the NRA and set up to do trials there. Next slide, please. There was a ballooning of trials that happened and there was a fallout from that. Basically because in a rush to recruit patients quickly and to cut costs as much as possible, there was a fair amount of exploitation of patient populations. There was a lack of awareness of the rights of participants. There were safety issues in trials with adverse events not being reported. There were other ethical challenges, such as the poor quality of informed consent or of review processes. Patients essentially were not protected, and if they had trial-related injuries, then issues of compensation were very rarely settled because the whole process of getting insurance and then calculating how much compensation was to be paid had not really been worked out very well. And of course, there was a lack of post-trial access to successfully developed drugs and vaccines. This led to a lot of discussion, both in country and among partners, to say that this was a situation that could not continue. And there has been a lot of excellent guidance that has been put out since then, focusing on trying to improve this situation. The next slide, please. When we look at low and middle income countries, there are also challenges of facilities, of sites, of processes, of not having people who are trained in the same clinical research environment as can be found in more industrialized countries. There's also a lack of investigator initiated trials because there isn't expertise for design and conduct of such studies. Laboratory support can be an issue and frequently when trials come into countries, when the problems are huge, you can have com competing research priorities and the funding for execution, particularly when the funding is derived from in-country resources, can be quite insufficient to address deficiencies. That said, there are in South Asia, in Africa, truly outstanding clinical trial sites, and we are going to hear from a couple of people who have tremendous experience with conducting clinical research in Brazil and in South Africa just after this. The next slide, please. Now, if we look at the kinds of systems that we are dealing with in low and middle income countries, there can sometimes be a mix of public and private services where access to healthcare is a huge issue and many patients need to pay out of pocket. There are limited government services. They can, when you need to access care for certain kinds of conditions, they are either not available or are very expensive. In these kinds of settings, you also have multiple systems of medicine, many which rely on culture or religion, which are traditional treatments which can also make the conduct of clinical research quite difficult. There is a lack of patient education and support and healthcare staff are not familiar with trials. All of it can raise the bar for trying to do trials in developing countries. Mm -hmm. Next slide, please. Now, when we come to regulatory challenges, Many regulators in low and middle income countries are reliant on having acquired expertise in looking at products that have been made elsewhere before, that have been through a regulatory pathway elsewhere. So when it comes to first in human studies, they are a little nervous sometimes about approaching these kinds of studies and the requirements for them are not uniform. 
There is a complexity in the approvals process. Frequently, you have multiple agencies that overlap and have different processes. So then anybody wanting to do a trial, particularly a regulatory trial, has to run around to get many kinds of approvals and it can become quite circular. For innovations, it becomes challenging and some countries, this is changing particularly for SARS-CoV-2, but accelerated approvals for innovative products are sometimes hard to find. The consistency and the quality of the review can vary and it would be outstanding if we had regulators that had timelines and performance management so that there was responsibility for on them to be able to deliver a quality review. Review committees change a lot and having the same review committee through the development cycle of a product would be a huge advantage to those seeking to have new drugs or vaccines tested in low and middle income countries. Pre-submission discussions are now being arranged in Africa and in Asia, and these have led to uh, some easing of the path for uh, getting approvals for trials. Uh, looking at collaborations really between the regulator, government, and industry, and academics would be a good way to think through how we can counter the risk aversion that reviewers currently have for testing any product where the safety profile has not been defined elsewhere. And there is an approach now to look at injury compensation requirements and at safety monitoring. So while I paint a pretty bleak picture of what has happened in the last 20 years, this has been the basis for a lot of change that has been driven by governments, by regulators, by the World Health Organization, both in Asia and Africa that have brought regulators together from different countries to establish platforms so that clinical research can be better conducted. Next slide, please. This is just my last slide, and this is a clinical trials toolkit that was developed in India. The idea here was to support both industry and academic researchers with all the steps that are required for clinical trials. This is something that is aligned with the regulatory pathway in the country and makes it easier for people to do trials in India. This is built off a similar toolkit that's available in the UK, and we could be thinking about having similar products available in other places as well. So I'll end there and leave you to the next two talks that I'm looking forward to as well. Thank you so much, Gagandeep. So uh, uh, we're trying to stabilize connection and hopefully she will join us for the uh, panel discussion. Uh, in the meantime, I'll do the easy job of introducing the next two speakers. Uh, the next one is Ricardo Palacio and he is currently leads the clinical development of uh, immunobiological products, mainly vaccines, uh, at the, uh, as the clinical research medical director at Instituto Butanen in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Uh, and he will be talking to us about the uh, experience of setting up a trial uh, in Brazil. So Ricardo, please uh, go ahead. So thank you very much for the invitation. So uh, next slide, please. So first of all, let me introduce my institution. So we are a, an institution that is kind of an old fashioned institute, best model. So it was a research institution, a public institution that also has a manufacturing plant. Uh, we actually are one of the largest manufacturers of immunobiological serum and vaccines. Uh, we produce 70 million doses of flu vaccines and this year. Uh, for the public health system of Brazil. And we work in several partnerships for vaccine development with the private institutions, uh, Big Pharma and with uh, 
public uh, institutions as well. And next, please. So uh, whenever we started partnership, and this really was not different for COVID-19 vaccine development, we assess, uh, of course, non-clinical and clinical aspects, but we also assess the feasibility of tech transfer for local production and how we can agree in future distribution. So we usually set up different kind of agreements according to these uh, assessments, so agreements on non-clinical or clinical development, uh, agreements in product uh, development. Sometimes it's necessary to have some uh, for the development of the product. This ensure of a distribution agreement and the tech transfer agreement. We are committed as a, a state policy in Brazil to have uh, the self-sufficiency uh, for the country. And uh, in the latest years, we are more focused also to supply uh, regional markets. Next slide, please. So in the, in the assessment, to talk in, in particular of, of uh, this uh, vaccine with uh, Sinovac, that is an activated uh, vaccine, uh, I will point out two uh, key articles key, key, that uh, allow us to move forward in this process. Uh, the first one is kind of a all the article is from 1990, and it was in a human infection model with a, a, a common called a coronavirus, the T29E. And uh, in this article, and I will want to draw your attention to the uh, lower uh, graph, and the black dots are the ones that have uh, low antibodies at the beginning of the experiment, and the white dots are the ones that who has a high antibody levels at the beginning of the experiment, and they were challenged uh, with this uh, coronavirus. And uh, as you can see, the, the ones with the, the black uh, dots, uh, they actually were challenged, they were infected, and they have an increase of the antibodies, and then in decay. And uh, in the other ones with high levels, uh, they were unable to infect uh, uh, with this uh, experimental model. And the other thing that we consider is that um, Sinovac uh, during the SARS uh, at the beginning of the century, they create a vaccine, an inactivated vaccine, and they were able to demonstrate with this technology in 2004 in the phase one trial that they create uh, a vaccine with a, a good uh, level of neutralizing antibodies that are the ones that in the, in the other uh, graphs shown, is the same kind. And then uh, and we realized that probably this could be a good strategy. Uh, in addition, the inactivated technology is a very old technology, very reliable in producing antibodies. And this is something that uh, we can easily incorporate. Next slide, please. So, uh, the first agreement that we have is a, a two uh, a, a clinical development agreement between the two companies. So we have some studies that are will be in charge of Sinovac, and some studies that will be in charge of uh, Butantan. So our uh, first study in this uh, uh, development is a phase three study with healthcare professionals with near 9,000 participants. Next slide, please. Uh, so there are some key aspects that um, uh, some of you have discussed, but it, uh, are very critical in the protocol design. And they were the, the ones that we are pioneering this phase three designs, we are uh, having troubles in defining which uh, definition, for example, case definition, as uh, and Dr. Amos uh, just uh, mentioned, uh, how to make the diagnostic of this, uh, the sampling and uh, age limits and previous exposure and so on. So several discussions with the regulatory agency. Next slide, please. Uh, so let me show you very quickly, this is our timeline since the signature of the agreement in the 11th of June until the first participant in that is scheduled next Monday. So you can see from the submission, the formal submission of the IND dossier and to the first patient in, we will have near one month uh, distance. Next slide, please. And this is just to show you some of the states that we choose and the epidemiological analysis. So uh, we choose in, in several states in the country. Next. 
And uh, of course, we have to work in parallel to all these epidemiological assessments, work with the reg uh, 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 regulatory approvals, ethical approvals, also in inside readiness, in meaning site selection, vendor selection, and establishing the gaps uh, for operational uh, assessment, legal aspects, uh, training, and, and so on. Next slide, please. So this is the list of the sites. I, I want to thank all of them, you know, the teams in, in the clinical sites. And let, next, that is the last one, please. And of course, I want to add thanks in advance to the volunteers that will be really the key for uh, having an answer in, in this first vaccine. And we expect to pave the way for the vaccines that are coming. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ricardo. That was a really nice uh, overview. And uh, we'll hear of a similar experience now uh, that uh, Shabir Emadi is going to tell us from South Africa. And uh, Shabir is a professor of vaccinology at the University of uh, Witwatersrand, Johannesburg, South Africa. And he's a co-director of the African Leadership Initiative of Vaccinology Expertise. Uh, and he's the principal investigator of the South African COVID-19 vaccine trial. So, Shabir, uh, we look forward to hearing your experience of setting up a trial in South Africa. Uh, so, good day, everyone, and thank you for providing me the opportunity. Uh, so, the study that I'm going to be presenting on uh, that's currently enrolling, in fact, I'm fortunate in that Sarah Gilbert has already introduced the vaccine. And there's a chimp adeno Oxford uh, novel coronavirus vaccine. And the study that we're doing in South Africa is a phase one, phase two study, uh, looking at uh, immunogenicity and safety in a limited number of individuals with HIV, as well as looking at safety, immunogenicity, and efficacy uh, in uh, adults without HIV. Uh, so the sponsor vaccine developer is obviously University of Oxford, but the study is actually funded by the South African Medical Research Council and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. The arrangement with Oxford to actually undertake the study in South Africa was done prior to the University of Oxford entering into an agreement with AstraZeneca. And it was really uh, the South African investigators reaching out to the University of Oxford to see whether they would be interested in at least providing vaccine for such a study to be conducted in South Africa. So the study is currently being done in one of the nine provinces, which is Gauteng, which is the most densely populated uh, province in South Africa, and will be expanding to a second uh, province in the next week. Next slide, next slide please. So it's got three different arms. Uh, in the first group, it's basically looking at people without HIV, looking at uh, immune responses and safety to a two-dose schedule. Uh, the second group, which is a large expanded immunogenicity safety group, also has an, a vaccine efficacy component built into it. It's an adaptive study design and so far as at the start of the study, we weren't sure whether we were planning on using a single dose or two doses of vaccine for group two, which is the efficacy group. Uh, but based on the most recent data, it appears that we will be using a two-dose schedule. And then the third group is the group with uh, HIV. And the reason why this is especially important to include in South Africa is that there's quite a strong demand from civil society to ensure an inclusiveness of people living with HIV in terms of the clinical development of vaccines as well as other therapeutics. So there isn't a leg in terms of deriving the necessary data to inform its use in that particular group. Uh, in terms of the efficacy outcome, the main endpoint is basically looking at uh, all severity of COVID-19 disease uh, in individuals that are COVID-19 naive at the time of randomization. And that is to be both zero negative uh, as well as testing negative for the virus within 96 hours preceding randomization. And this is actually something that we needed to uh, sort of amend the protocol for, as I'll show you in the next slide to follow. Next slide. So Cherry sort of raised the issue in terms of some of the regulatory uh, hurdles when conducting studies uh, in low middle income countries. And South Africa is relatively fortunate in that we've got a relatively mature regulatory framework. But even then, under the previously prior to COVID-19, it would usually take anything between four to six months for a study to be approved by the regulatory authority, which is known as SAPRA, as well as by the ethics committee, which usually take two to three months. 
We were fortunate in that both the ethics committee as well as SAPRA, the regulatory authority, had put into place measures to ensure an expedited, uh, uh, expedited timeline in terms of approval, in terms of review as well as approval of studies related to COVID-19 therapeutics as well as uh, vaccines. And consequently, we were able to condense that time period from four to six uh, months to four to six weeks. In addition to which amendments are basically being reviewed over a period of two to five working days, which has really assisted the study. Uh, next slide, please. So we've started the study in South Africa at a time when we actually very much on upward trajectory in terms of the, this current wave of the outbreak. As you can see, we have not as yet peaked, but compared to many of the uh, European countries, they have pretty much waning in terms of the epidemic. So that would appear as an advantage, but at the same time, it's come with some challenges. Uh, next slide. Uh, and one of the major challenges is at the time of the start of the study, uh, the plan was to test uh, for, for infection at a time of randomization. And what emerged uh, after having enrolled the first 100 subjects uh, is that roughly about 20% of participants that were asymptomatic, that were been screened at the time of randomization, ended up testing positive for the virus. Uh, is a positive test or an indeterminate test. And many of these indeterminate tests ended up being positive because it appears they were being caught at an early stage of infection, or some of them might actually have been recovering from, from uh, infection uh, that preceded their enrollment. So that required sort of a change to the protocol and an amendment, which now requires for a screening to be done for active infection at least 96 hours before the person is randomized. And even with that implementation, we find that with a screening visit, roughly about 20% of, of volunteers that are now being screened are either positive at the time of enrollment or have a result which is indeterminate. But like I said, many of those indeterminate results are turning out to be positive on subsequent uh, testing. Next slide. Uh, so the current timelines is that we planning to complete enrollment of 2000 participants by August 2020 and uh, the efficacy readout is looking for 60% efficacy with a lower bound of greater than 0%. So we need to accrue 42 cases and at least 14 days after the first dose of vaccine. And the projection is we probably would reach that uh, end point number roughly by about the end of November, December, because of the large force of infection currently underway in the country. Next slide. One of the issues that we've had to deal with was some sort of a protest with regard to conducting studies in South Africa because of some unfortunate remarks from two French scientists related to BCG vaccines should be in terms of its possible protection against COVID-19, that those sort of studies should be done in Africa, and I think most people are aware of that. But by and large, we've had a very favorable response in terms of enrollment, and this has been assisted by, as an example, the Dean of the Faculty of Health Sciences, at the university also volunteering to participate in the study. Next slide. So thank you for your attention. So thank you so much, Shabir. So uh, excellent overview by the two speakers regarding their experiences and where they're at in terms of setting up these trials. Uh, I think we have Deborah's connection stabilized. So Deborah, uh, are you able to take over and I can start off with uh, posing the question which uh, uh, Marianne Koopmans has put in the chat box and you know I, I think many of us are uh, questioning that uh, you know uh, regarding the uh, possibility of multinational trials whether they're in LMICs or across countries as we know over the past six months uh, the pandemic has uh, traveled across the world uh, and by the time the vaccines are going to be, uh, you know, looking at the efficacy, um, uh, for example, many of the vaccines that are initiated in Oxford or in other places, and certainly in Canada, we are going to struggle to be able to do any kind of efficacy. You know, uh, South Africa and Brazil, not that it, but are in a position to test that. But six months from now, are we going to be able to actually look at that? So I guess I'm going to start by asking. Uh, Gagandeep to, uh, you know, uh, weigh in on that in terms of what would be the mechanism to move forward to see the efficacy. In terms of looking at multinational studies, um, while it's true that there has been a focus on high and middle income countries so far, 
there are many low middle income countries that are willing to participate in trials. WHO has the Solidarity 3 protocol being developed and they have asked for expressions of interest from multiple trial sites and have many sites that have uh, signed up to participate in trials. Many regulators are also willing to review such studies and conduct them. In addition, the US is using its clinical research network sites that have been supported through the National Institutes of Health. And their intention is that many of the vaccines that they are testing might be tested off, um, offshore as well. So I think it's very likely that we are going to have multi-country studies and obviously the goal right now is to do uh, multiple vaccines being compared in the same trial. One of the biggest worries of course is when you start getting into phase three trials, do you have enough sites and do you have enough patients to be able to test all of the candidates that are come in the pipeline at the moment? Okay, so I guess at this point, I'm going to ask Deborah because, you know, as uh, many of you know, her specialty is regulatory uh, aspects. So, Deborah, do you want to comment and then maybe take over the questions? Sure, thank you. And, and thank you, Cherry, for that um, uh, response. Um, and again, sorry for the, for the technical difficulties uh, today. Um, there are a lot of things going on. I'll just make a, a, just a couple comments about, um, you know, uh, regulatory and, and what was, you know, said before. It, regulators across the, the, the globe are, you know, learning as much as, as we all are at the same time. And so, um, you know, and, and they're, they're trying to be as flexible as possible within the constraints of the the regulations of of, of their of their region and 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 the like. And so, um, and I can speak as far as uh, you know, FDA uh, released uh, guidance uh, a week or so ago, um, which uh, on the onset seemed very um, you know conservative and sort of uh, may, maybe traditional in in the sense. However, you know, one needs to re uh, remember that guidance is just that, it's, it's, it's recommendations and it really comes down to the traditional relationship that the agency or any regulator has with the developer. And when it comes to, uh, you know, that regulator with data um, and, and justification and rationale, if it doesn't mirror what is spelled out in in any type of guidance and so um you know that being said uh, i think that there are um that there's enough uh room and tools in the regulatory toolbox at at at, at this stage you know to get where we need to, to go the, the the conundrum is just that though um that for uh large-scale phase three efficacy trials um that because of the waning uh, numbers in areas, uh, uh, you know, across the globe, um, that that is a conundrum. And I think that um, I, I know that um, you know various uh, uh, groups, uh, including you know WHO and uh, vaccine cluster. Uh, uh, meetings and organizations such as uh, uh, ICMRA um, are, you know, trying to look at these global um, regulatory issues. Um, so I'll, I'll ask uh, the next question uh, is for Sabir is, uh, did you need to have enough space for so social distancing um, and did that slow the enrollment process? Yeah, so we've needed to set up sort of makeshift facilities to ensure that we can maintain physical distancing. In, in addition to which we've sort of got a roster that participants need to adhere to in terms of coming in. So we staggered throughout the day. So it's worked reasonably well. I don't, I don't think it's been an impediment in terms of the rate of enrollment. Okay, thank you. Um, 
I don't have any other questions from the from the um, Q and A online. Um, I guess maybe if I can just ask a question is, uh, and and to the group, and I'll start with Cherry. Uh, how can we ensure that um, you know the global capacity to test the most promising candidates in clinical trials are sufficiently powered uh, to provide the highest possible level of evidence on safety and efficacy? So I think this is where global consultations are very helpful, where having regulators talk to each other is useful. What tends to happen if regulators are working on their own and working with companies that they've worked with before, they adhere to local standards and not necessarily international ones. The fact that the FDA has now put out guidance is very useful. There is an estimate of the number, or the protocol, for example, for the Moderna site being posted in, and the registration in clinicaltrials.gov that gives you the size of the trial that needs to be done in phase three is particularly valuable because you know you're aiming for a point estimate of 50% efficacy at least, and that's going to require 30,000 participants. That's a reality check, I think, for many regulators, particularly in LMICs. And if we keep, if we do these studies that become multinational studies, all the regulators are going to have to realize that these studies need to be large so that they are sufficiently powered. I think that's a realization that is coming to them. And the more consultations that we have like this, the more interactions there are, the better it will be. Thank you. Um, uh, Ricardo or, or the other, Amal or uh, Sabir, would you want to uh, comment? Yeah, I, mean, I, I agree with Chetty. Obviously, the big issue is how this uh, pandemic is going to unfold moving forward and whether we can anticipate additional waves of the outbreak, which seems to be possibly the case. But I guess it's all an issue of timing. So as an example, in the South African study where we, uh, where we were assuming an attack rate as low as 3.5%, we needed uh, 2,000 participants to get the vaccine rate out of 60%. So it really depends on how the pandemic uh, unfolds over the next few months, which will determine the sample size and how effective we would be and how quickly we would be able to get the result in terms of an efficacy readout from these studies. Uh, thank you. I, I would like to comment something that is, uh, if any manufacturer, for example, in, of inactivated vaccine wants to do the round phase three trial, probably it could be a waste of resources. So we need to establish probably families of vaccines and establish a monomarkers in order that they can copy or they can use this, these monomarkers to have a surrogate to get the approval and probably make some post licensure commitments rather than every single manufacturer trying to make, make a big mega trial uh, because it, that could be useless. So for example, the difference in the technology probably are not so significant between the adenovirus family, between the inactivated vac uh, vaccines family, between the subunit family. So probably it would be smarter if the uh, institutions like CEPI, WHO, and all the COVAX can foster this kind of agreements in between the companies in order to truly share this kind of correlates of protections and share the information and the procedures to avoid doing the same trial and again and again and again because it, that is useless. That's, that's my point of view. Yeah, I guess, I mean, just to chip in here, I, when, I mean, uh, Ricardo, it is a very important point. And I think we, we heard about the constraints and the capacities which are very limited. And there have also been thoughts, I think this was put, uh, put up earlier also, whether we could have, uh, you know, vaccines uh, which, are, which are aligned in timelines and could they be uh, merged into one trials, for example, I mean, it, instead, of, instead of blocking the capacities of sites. So maybe, maybe uh, sequentially, and if uh, 
you know, uh, as you know, Debra, I mean, COVAX, for example, it's at the heart of COVAX in the sense, trying to achieve this kind of global collaborations and uh, efficient use of resources, which we know are very, very limited. So yeah, there would be a requirement of a lot of out of the box thinking for these cases. Thank you all. I just, I also wanted to just let the participants uh, also know that uh, within COVAX, and, and I just lightly touched over it, um, but, uh, you know, just because a vaccine is, a vaccine might not be in the COVAX structure, you know, we're still, we have uh, three SWAT teams that, um, uh, we have clinical uh, enabling sciences and manufacturing, as well as a regulatory advisory group um, that will um, tackle uh, product agnostic issues. And I, I, I can see where, and, and the regulatory advisory group um, spans the, the, the three uh, SWAT teams uh, and, and, and issues will come up from the vaccine product uh, uh, groups that that's the traditional relationship that um, that we have with you know uh, shepherding uh, the regulatory or in the development of vaccines uh, but just to say that you know issues like this um, you know you know resource saving and not um, recreating the wheel uh, and and talking about uh, you know potentially you know surrogate endpoints would be something that, uh, you know, because specifically in the FDA guidance, it said that, you know, they're not, they're not seeking uh, accelerated approval using uh, surrogate endpoints or uh, correlates of protection. Uh, however, I mean, you know, we're, again, we're all learning at the same time. So, um, these types of um, engagements through COVAX uh, can be utilized to help the, the whole field. Um, and we're still looking how to, um, you know, uh, communicate those uh, interactions that we have within, you know, the SWAT teams and, and what the regulatory advisory group will opine on by having, you know, um, open door workshops that's available for all vaccine manufacturers, just not the, the vaccines that are in, in the COVAX structure. So um, I just wanted to let uh, you know, participants know that as well. Are there any other questions? Um, any other, um, uh, uh, we're coming up to time anyway, and so I think that it's probably time to wrap up, but uh, just to give my uh, panel members anything else that you think, um, if there are any remaining gaps that you know the 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 vaccine developer landscape and or uh, globe at our members can um, you know uh, need to know and just to add uh, Deborah I mean in, in terms of uh, again coming back to the site capacity thing and and how we can I guess we uh, th th there could also be a role that epidemiology plays I mean in and prospectively looking at how the, I mean, of course, nobody can predict how, how the outbreak will move, but at least learning from the previous uh, experiences. And then uh, that kind of uh, activity in trying to predict, uh, not, I shouldn't say predict, but you know, how, how the outbreak will move. And and based on that, doing the site selections or, or you know, or doing, doing your trial, uh, going to a particular region or, or a site is, uh, could be a way of doing a very informed or a calculated guess or a, or a, or a uh, you know, trying to efficiently use again the sites or the resources. Yeah. Uh, may I add something uh, that is uh, a, when the, this kind of organization, a big organization, no matter with which one it is, a big pharma or CEPI or WHO, whatever, is approaching individual clinical sites to join those uh, uh, trials to, to come, there is always a concern, and uh, this is something that should be assured, is that either in the public there is a question mark whether this vaccine that has, is being tested in my country could be accessible to the population of the country. So this is something that should be addressed in particular when uh, this kind of organization are looking at individual clinical sites 
uh, because this question is a rise in the public and we saw that in Brazil uh, recently. Uh, we have these two approaches, the first one from Oxford that came and, and in this regard uh, and, and it came with one individual clinical site and only later on, like more or less one month later, uh, they, uh, there is an agreement with the government. Uh, with the federal government. In our case, we set up the agreement in both sides. But this is a question mark, for example, for other countries I would mention in Latin America, Peru, Chile, that are, are being targeted for future cl clinical trials. So for example, the network that has been established by the US government uh, using the HPTA and HPTN sites that they you know, close the, the doors to other uh, manufacturers, but they don't warrant that the vaccine would be accessible for the population. So this is something that probably should be addressed in some way, uh, and an individual clinical site has no power to negotiate that. Great, thank you. I think we're gonna have to um, close, and I just will um, just wrap up for a, a couple of, of comments uh, going forward. I mean, this has been a, a, a great uh, first start in talking about, you know, uh, vaccines. And um, as I said earlier in my earlier remarks, uh, there's a lot of information and a lot of things uh, happening and going forward, uh, you know, we are all focused on one goal. And I think that, um, uh, you know, uh, there's much more to learn, much more to share. Uh, but I think that when we, when we do this together in an end-to-end -end approach with transparency as much as possible, there are some, um, definitely some uh, uh, hurdles there to, to work out. But uh, I, I think that what we're learning uh, in this pandemic is that there were a lot of gaps, um, uh, you know, across uh, the, the international space. Um, and I think that there will be a great uh, lessons learned and after action after this, uh, after this pa pandemic uh, wanes and we get, you know, not one vaccine, but multiple vaccines um, out to those uh, that need it. And so I turn it over to uh, Yazdin for any other um, final remarks. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Deborah. Uh, and uh, I wanted to thank all the uh, panelists, all the speakers uh, for this uh, great uh, session actually on vaccine. I think it was very useful for the other researchers who are on the field. Uh, to listen to all what you have done and congratulate you for all the efforts. Although the vaccine uh, will be something that we will hear for the another uh, months and months, I think. Um, so thanks again to everyone. Uh, just also to follow up to say that uh, we will continue with this synergies meeting. <laughs> so tomorrow at the same time, uh, we have the therapeutics, as you know, on Monday we have transmission, uh, on uh, uh, Tuesday we have social sciences, and then we will have on Thursday, July 23rd, a summary of all the session and the discussion panel. Uh, and uh, thanks to everyone. Uh, of course, you don't need to come to many of them, but uh, it, it will be great, uh, great session. So you are invited. and. Uh, uh, and uh, I, I think that uh, you can come in if you want to leave, but I think that it will be very important, all these sessions, and to have you all around will be very and extremely uh, uh, productive. Uh, and just to finish, I have three minutes left. I really wanted to thank uh, for all the work done in addition to panelists and to, of course, uh, speakers. So first of all, Charu, who had done a great job for, for actually, um, uh, it's uh, moderating, supervising, and everything, and all the team uh, from Canada, so Geneviève, Daniela, everyone from uh, Fondation Merieu, from Welcome Trust, from European Commission, everyone has made a huge job around all this to make it happen. So thanks a lot. Charu, the final word is yours. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Yazdin. So yes, thank you to all the speakers and for really interesting discussions. I was watching and at, uh, at our peak attendance, we had over 200 people participating today. 
uh, you know, and uh, the goal of these meetings is really to bring people from across the world uh, to discuss on where we are in terms of trying to end this pandemic. Uh, so thank you everyone for all your discussions, participation, excellent questions, and uh, uh, lots of discussions. And we will see you tomorrow morning uh, at the therapeutic ses session. Have yeah, a good day. be careful. It's morning for her. It's afternoon for us. <laughs> Oh, yeah, tomorrow morning, afternoon, evening. I know we are covering globe to globe. Yeah, no, I'm just kidding. Thank you. So see you tomorrow. Bye. Much. Thank you. Bye.